I'm developing the Devin Nash treatment for depression. Yeah. And then people say like, okay, how are you going to like find depressed people? I'm going to ask him, Hey man, are you depressed? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, come on. You're going to spend an hour with Devin Nash. And then at the end of the hour, I'm going to ask you, Hey man, are you depressed? And he says, no. And I'm like, boom, done. Sure. <laughs> There we go. There he is. There we go. Okay. Now that in combination over here. Now we got to get you on this screen. I have a very special. Where did I put it? Uh... And if, if you're getting reverb, I have my uh, gaming headset. Oh, no way. Plug. Awesome. Should I just plug that in? Last time there was reverb, there might be again if it's the same setup. Maybe. Uh, I think we've improved. Oh, yeah. Every week we're learning more. Devin. Oh, God. Tell, tell me about it. How have you? How have you I installed this thing called VST host. Okay. And then I have a, I have like a Yamaha mixer. Oh shit. And um, so we're like upgrading and I'm learning how to do this thing called streaming. What's it like to have like 10,000 IQ dude? Like it took me like two years to figure out that stuff. <laughs> oh, oh, so De Devin, mm -hmm. let's be clear. Mm -hmm. When we say, when I say we're doing this stuff, someone <laughs> who knows how to do this stuff is doing it for me. Got it. Okay. Window capture. Let's talk there. So like literally I watched a YouTube tutorial and, and set up this, uh, um, set up this stuff. And then Tomination Time. Do you know Tomination Time? Uh, they came by the chat and I think I was like in the middle of a talk, so I didn't see them. But So Tom has been incredibly helpful. Really? Also, also was... I've I've educated myself about trolls and I I think I I vastly underestimated what trolls are capable of. <laughs> oh yeah? <laughs> I thought I we had yeah. that conversation from before, did we did we? <laughs> yeah, I mean I still want to talk to trolls on your channel and or trolls on mine. Oh yeah? <laughs> like I, I we were thinking about actually creating like a separate like if you're a troll and you you know like creating a separate email address that trolls could email to come on stream and talk about why they troll things. I mean, I, I'm sure you could get like a self-conscious one at some point, um, the, but like true trolls just want to watch the world burn. That's the problem with them. There's no, there's no compromising with them, right? Yeah. So I mean, yeah. I think if you give them a microphone, they won't like it because that's not how they operate, right? They like, they like to throw fruit and vegetables from the audience onto stage. Oh shit, man! I don't know. I think all they want is a microphone. The whole thing is about attention. Um, that that's like like the only way that I've found to stop them is by actually just ignoring them. All right, you're here. Yeah. So we'll we'll see. We'll see what we end up doing. Well, if anybody but can I, solve I, this problem, it's you. I mean, I, I I would like to talk to trolls though. Yeah. I'm I'm curious because I think you're right. Like they want to watch the word world burn. So the question is, why do they want to watch the world burn? Hmm. Like what's what's important about that to them? Um do you know a do you know a dude named Jordan Peterson? Yeah. He probably has the best view on this because he's probably encountered the most amount of trolls. And his theory is that it's it's a expression of an inner hatred of the world as a result of like a really nihilist view on things. So, so it's like you hate your own existence and lack of purpose so much that you despise anybody that has one. Yeah. So, I mean, didn't we talk about that last time we talked about trolls? Like, why are people trolling you? No, we didn't. We didn't cover that. I thought we did. I thought we said, I, I thought I mentioned that I think the reason you're getting trolled is because you're doing something with your life and that offends them. You did say that. that yeah. People, People mm -hmm. come to your stream in order to make substantial positive changes in their life. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, th I think that's consistent with what Jordan Peterson says, because you guys are in the search for meaning and they they've had trouble finding meaning. So anyone who is building what they have looked for and not found, it, it really hurts them. It affects their <laughs> ego. Yeah. You, you said you tell them the truth you don't want to hear uh, since your message is one of empowerment and agency over your life. Um, what invites the most hatred is meeting the person that you want to be. That's what she said. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> that's that's uh, that's pretty neat. So you've been um, you've been like moving forward with the whole streaming thing in in the week that we've or two weeks or whatever that we've been not talking, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we've been streaming. We've had a couple people on, and and it's been fun. 
um, I enjoy talking to people. I had my first like kind of challenging interview because I think someone came on stream and like didn't really know why they wanted to come on stream or didn't really know what was wrong. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of like they were being super vague. And so it was really challenging because I think that they like sensed that something was missing for their, from their life, but they didn't know what it was or how to articulate it. Doesn't that usually um, take a really long time in therapy to like build that up because you have to understand that first? You have to understand why they're there or they have to understand why they're yeah. there. Yeah. So, I mean, we did it in half an hour. <laughs> that's insane. Yeah. But, that's, but, uh, that's but it was challenging. I mean, I didn't know if we would, you know, if we'd get there. Cause it was, it was tricky, but it's, it's been fun to, you know, talk to a lot of people and, and see how things are going. Um, Good, man. and yeah. reaching out to people, hopefully helping some people. So is the majority of what you're doing still, um, direct one-on-one -on -one type of therapy basically. And then using that as an example for how other people can follow it, or are you doing more? Yeah. So I think, I think, so first of all, to be clear, it's not therapy. And sorry, I that's a, that's a buzzword. Yes. Over the yeah. Internet. Mm -hmm. um, but so I, I think what I do is just talk to people. And yeah. so usually my stream, like I stream for like two hours at a time. Right. And right. I may have like a little intro where I'll like kind of talk a little bit about what we've talked about, or if I just have thoughts that I'd like to share with the universe. And then we usually do like an interview that'll last 45 minutes to an hour and it'll be on different kinds of topics. Um, and so it, it's just, that, that's based on like what people, you know, want to talk about. So Last last week we had um, someone from Rise Above the Disease or the, sorry disorder. disorder. Who was that? Um, Crystal Navarro. Yeah, I know Crystal. Yeah, Crystal's so, Jason. Uh, Crystal works with Jason Docton. I know Jason. Super. Yeah, that was the guy that I wanted to connect you with last week when I told you. Oh, yeah, it's Jason Docton. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so it's funny actually. Someone at the conference that I was at, I was at a conference this morning, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, a conference about like technology and in, in in healthcare. And uh, someone there also wanted me to connect me wanted to connect me with with Jason as well. Um, yeah, I can totally do. It. I'm on the board of uh, Rise Against the Disorder. I would love. To, oh, really? Yeah, I'd love to yeah, help. So yeah, small work world. Totally. Um, yeah. <laughs> or or yeah. just a small group of people that are interested in solving a really big problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Um. Anyway, so I so she was on for about half an hour. We talked about that a little bit, and then since she had to go, uh, um, we actually like switched gears and. Someone came on and talked about. He, so his question is, "Why do I date people that are like my parents?" Oh, and, geez. And so that was fun. We <laughs> talked about that for a little while, and then and then this other guy came on. So usually I'll like talk a little bit. We'll do like an interview for about forty five minutes, and then we'll sort of do Q and A afterward based on like stuff that comes up in the interview. So cool. like, do other mm -hmm. people feel like they you know they date like do they find themselves dating like the same kind of person over and over and over again? Like, why is that? Um, and then, yeah, I mean, so so that's usually the format. Got it. Okay. And so you and I are doing something kind of a little bit more. Um, I, I think since we're also like sort of starting to commit to like more regular talks, which I love. Yeah. I mean, that, that I, is, I love that idea. Yeah, that is amazing. Um, maybe You're very can... good at asking questions. By oh, the way. really? Thank you. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. you. I have um, I, 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 a big reason for that, I think, is I prep a lot. Like I spend a lot of time. And also another big reason for it is like I read so many books and I've listened to so many podcasts and I've like done so much work on trying to understand self-improvement. That, that now that I finally have someone in front of me that it can answer all those questions, it's like a genie that I could just like continuously ask questions, just pop answers out of a freaking magic lantern. And I'm like, this is amazing. Like, <laughs> this is everything I've always wanted, you know, so it's like really easy to do. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I think you yeah. ask good questions. You ask questions that capture the nuance or essence of things, thank which you. is hard. Th thank you so much. That means a lot. It's really cool. I, I um I think one of the things that we could do is sort of um build a over over the course of time build a foundation of of understanding of some of these like topics and and the thing that I want to nail you on um most of all is some kind of, and we don't have to get into that right now because I have a couple of like intro stuff, but like some kind of objective template for, because here's what I was thinking about between the last time we talked and now. And, and, and actually before we, well, I'll say that and then we should probably reintroduce you to people that are watching you for the first time. There'll be a lot of those people. So there are going to be people who don't absorb the full percentage of what you say. Or even they're, they're going to give you like a certain amount of time of day that's like relevant to their attention span and how interested they are in the subject. 
So as much as possible, we have to work to try to distill into a template. Like objectively, if you were going to improve self-improvement, what are some of the things that people can do and, and, and why? And I think once we sort of like build the foundation of that understanding and, and, and like at a high level and a granular level, it'll be really cool. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think that's, that's, um, you know, that's a big task. So I think somewhere along the way, like whenever I teach about meditation and stuff like that, people ask me like, oh, this is really helpful. Is there a book we can read? And then the really disappointing thing is I say, no. So there are yeah. a lot of books on meditation out there, but I, I think the real problem with a lot of dissemination of information is that, especially in the meditative world, is you have teachers who learn from their teachers who learn from their teachers who learn from a master. Mm -hmm. And so they start following a script and then they start to lose how that script was made. Right. So it's like, it's like you're instead of understanding like e equals MC squared, you're just like copying and pasting like iterations of that formula instead of understanding the basic elements that allow you to develop a meditative tradition. You know what's so and weird about it, that is that I feel like meditation is a s introspective practice that I guess if you just do it will bear fruit, but you're saying it doesn't unless it's technique based. Like if someone just sits no, down and starts meditating, like they lose it. So I think what happens is, is people emphasize the technique, right? So mm -hmm. if you go to a meditation, like a particular tradition of meditation, they're going to say, like, if, for example, if you go to a Zen meditation, they're going to say, this is the way to meditate. Yeah. And they don't really acknowledge that there are like thousands of ways to meditate. They say, they say this is our way. Mm -hmm. But like the person who developed Zen is the one who truly understood it. Yeah, that's true. And so what's happening is like everyone else is just following a playbook. But like in order to really understand the stuff, in order to do what you're talking about, you have to be able to make the playbook. You have to be able to create your own place because that's when you truly understand the pieces involved. Did you ever read Siddhartha by Herman Hesse? Yeah, many years ago. Yeah, there's a, there's a scene in it where, so in Siddhartha's world, Buddha already exists. So Siddhartha is going through the world and meets the Buddha as a separate person who's already become enlightened. And yeah. he says exactly that to the Buddha. He says, this is assuredly the absolute best path to reach enlightenment that can be taught. The problem is that because I'm lacking that self element, I can't follow it. I have to go yeah. find that answer for myself. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that that's the challenge, right? Is like creating, you're asking to, uh, you're saying like, how do we distill what we're talking about to be like a road that people can follow? And honestly, like, I think if you want to, so I'm working on that. It's funny. I sat down and uh, actually the result of the streaming, a lot of stuff is coalesced for me. And I wrote mm -hmm. like three pages about anxiety and like, it's sort of like everything you need to understand about anxiety, just boil down, boil down to three pages. And it's wow. like, where does anxiety come from? Why do we have anxiety? What are the like physiologic anxiety versus cognitive anxiety? How do, how does anxiety affect your mind in the moment? And where are the roots of anxiety? So if you're thinking about tackling anxiety, you have to tackle the roots of it and you have to tackle the actual activity like in your thought process in the moment. And that division is very fundamental. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, you know, that's my goal too. The other wild and crazy thought that I had was that, so I've been thinking about distilling stuff too. And I was thinking about like, you know, we do a lot on Twitch and we like, you know, I think Twitch chat appreciates what we do and that's why we do it, right? So that people can, watch and learn. But ultimately, there's a part of me that says that, um, you know, you're never going to learn like what you want us to do, Devin, is not going to be possible through Twitch. That's why we're syndicating it to YouTube. <laughs> every 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 okay. talk that we do goes, yeah, you're right. Um, and, and actually, well, this is a fundamental problem with this platform that I've talked about to Twitch a lot, right? And I don't know how you solve it is like, how do you how do you convey meaningful information that sticks with people and lives somewhere in a live format. It's very hard. That's yeah. So yeah. I had a crazy idea, which is a little bit tangential to what you're saying. I was thinking, so we held our first retreat, like our he uh, healthy gaming retreat um, uh, in August. And it was a lot of fun. We went out to Yosemite national park gamers from all over the country showed up. Um, wow. And, and it was, it was fun. And it was like, we, I think it was like Wednesday to Sunday. And I had this idea that I, I'm kind of tempted to just sh like just tell the internet, and this is probably a terrible idea, <laughs> but just tell people that I'm going to be somewhere for 10 days. And if you guys want to learn 
stuff, like legitimately learn, like show, just show up and whoever wants to show up can show up. And we're just going to like work through this stuff. We're going to teach you how to meditate. We're going to teach you about anxiety. We're going to teach you about whatever you want to learn about. And let's like workshop, like make a retreat where people can just show up and then we're going to get through whatever we want to get through. So that we sort of go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, there's a really interesting idea in that is that what if you use your Twitch as a lead generation into those kind of events that do have that impact? What is a lead generation? What does that mean? Uh, it's a marketing term that means there, there's a, if you imagine a funnel, okay. And at the top is a, is a big circle. And at the bottom is a very small spigot, mm -hmm. right? At the, at the top, everything sort of falls into it and it gets shot out. The, 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 so the, the top of the funnel would be um, the way that you put ingredients in. So if you're going to pour water into the funnel, imagine water is people that need help, for example, right? Yeah. They all kind of go down in the funnel and they end up in the place you want them to be. So, so in this case, the, 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 the lead generation would mean bringing new people into the funnel from one source so that they can come out into another source. So they come in from the, they come in from Twitch, for example, and they come out the other end onto a seminar or a retreat or something that you want them to do. Yeah. I mean, I think that's because that, I'm just recognizing the shortcomings of like just not being able to help everyone, right? So I think a lot of yeah. people learn from interviews and, and like, oh, like what we're going to talk about today and stuff. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I think the most transformative experiences of my life have been kind of like in person, oh, yeah. where you're kind of working with someone intensely. And, and if people want to, you know, I don't think I think there are issues of like scalability and stuff. So I think the upside of something like Twitch, is that you can reach way more people like, you know, uh, you can reach hundreds of people or 1000s of people or 10s of 1000s of people at a time which you really can't do in a retreat. But I mean, I, I think this is a crazy idea for a couple of reasons. Cause like, it's not, it's not going to be planned. And like, I don't know who's going to show up. I don't know if someone's like, you know, if they're going to be hygiene issues or like if people are going to be respectful of each other and, <laughs> and things like that, like that's all problems. Like I was just thinking the other day. Um, so we had a bed bug scare in our house where there was like a concern that we had bed bugs and okay. I have young kids and they pick up bed bugs from all kinds of places. And so, like, I was just thinking, like, what if one dude, like, one fucking internet troll shows up with bed bugs? Oh, yeah. Or, like, lice. And then, like, <laughs> our, our, we're going to have to, like, quarantine and everyone is going to leave on day two because <laughs> we're such an interesting thought that you team. had. Like, there, there's, like, th there's gaming conventions uh, of, like, 100,000 people that go to, like, PAX West or whatever and, and haven't had some kind of epic pandemic beyond you know the the flu or whatever so which is which yeah. is miraculous it, it is yeah it makes you really think about <laughs> that the sort of uh the sort of d divine wave that there must be to to make that kind of stuff happen i can't believe something hasn't happened to some yeah. mutated virus hasn't come out of a gaming event and killed us all yeah <laughs> uh, uh in yeah, terms man. of in terms of twitch there's an interesting thing about scale is that you, you always have to continuously do things that get you the greatest awareness possible because of the way that scale works. If you can make one person's life or 10 people's life 50% better, you can make 1,000 people's lives 1% better, right? Um, the, the right answer, I think, is to do both. But Twitch is one of those platforms that you can really uniquely do that because there's going to be so many people that don't even, you, you don't even ever meet, by the way, right? Because the vast majority of people that are in your chat are not talking, mm -hmm. they're listening. Mm -hmm. and, and, and those people will walk away with impact that you may never hear about, or months later you'll get an email from somebody that's like, hey, this small catalyst was enough for me to change X, Y, and Z. And yeah. that, that's the reason you stay on Twitch, IMO. Yeah, it's funny. I did a Reddit AMA like a year ago, and I still get messages from people from it. So one reason for that, though, is because Reddit lives, right? So that, that AMA still exists somewhere. Yeah. And I actually found it, I think, when I was looking uh, for stuff for our show. Yeah. Yeah. So, so like, the one problem with Twitch is, like, once that VOD goes, it, there, there isn't – and nobody really watches it VOD. Dies. It dies. Right, yeah. yeah. So that's one of the reasons why um, I, I, I think it's really important to sort of document your whole Twitch journey by editing every video and putting it somewhere. I think that's, like, it's absolutely imperative. Yeah, preferably. Easier. I think so yeah. far we're doing that. Good. So yeah, all of the interviews. If you guys want to, yeah. So if 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 you want to see, I think the first meme of our channel was born on <laughs> today's Friday on Wednesday. What was that? And it was with this guy who was unclear whether he was. I think he was. You know, I think he's just not from the U.S., so his pattern of speaking was a little bit different. Okay. But there was some concern that he was a troll. I think it's just he was just speaking differently.
I, I do wonder a little bit if, honestly, I wonder if he was high, but you know, I'm clear. <laughs> um, but I, I think it's just, it, it's a, probably just a foreign accent, and maybe a dick thought for me to have, but um, yeah. So I, I think we're, we're trying to chop up videos and so people can watch if there's like issues that are relevant to them. So we've talked about self-judgment. We've talked about, um, we talked some about borderline personality disorder. We talked some about, uh, you know, how, like what kind of patterns we get into when we date people. We talked about feelings of inadequacy and, and kind of how to move forward. Mm -hmm. Um, so all that stuff is sort of being collated. So I'm, I'm behind what you're saying, man. Excellent. Yeah. I see it here. I have your YouTube pulled up. I'll link it in chat too. You guys should subscribe to this. There's a lot of good stuff here. So what are we talking about today, Devin? Well, uh, let's start off with like, uh, so, so people are know from your, from the title, uh, that you are a psychiatrist, but can you give like a, yeah. a short overview of, um, who you are? So for, for people that are new. Sure. Yeah. So, um, like 60 seconds. Oh, how, however long you want. Yeah. Okay. Whatever, whatever you so, feel uh, conveys the Olo message. Sure. So mm -hmm. my name is Alok Kanoja. I'm a psychiatrist. I practice in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, my practice is kind of has like two pieces to it. I spent uh, several years studying to become a monk before going to medical school. And that was actually, I, I, guess things, I guess things start with me almost failing out of college due to being addicted to video games and just playing too many video games all the time. Um, which oddly enough is not something I regret. I actually had a lot of fun those years and uh, played just a bunch of video games, almost failed out, and then decided something needed to change. So I ended up going to India um, the summer after my sophomore year and decided then to become a monk and spent about seven years coming back and forth between India and the U.S. studying yoga and meditation. Um, ended up meeting my wife, and uh, so then that made the monk and celibacy thing a little bit tricky. <laughs> and... Uh, so also she wanted to be married to a doctor. So I decided to go to medical school and, uh, did, did, um, a few years of neuroscience research, uh, studied medicine and then ultimately became a psychiatrist, um, trained up here in Boston. And now I'm, I, I still have a staff position at McLean hospital and I'm instructor in psychiatry at Harvard medical school, which is where I trained. Um, and most of what I do now in my practice is actually like holistic psychiatry. So I incorporate meditation, uh, Eastern medicine, nutrition, different kinds of psychotherapy. And I do a lot of like performance enhancement sort of psychotherapy. So optimizing your performance. I work with a lot of investment bankers, entrepreneurs, CEOs, um, NFL athletes, and more recently, esports athletes. Uh, so that's that's been a lot of fun. And then on the other side, I've started working with gamers. So half of my time is spent just working with people who are, I want to say to start off with, like addicted to video games, but I think a lot of times there are other issues at play, like issues of confidence or issues of, of shame, um, not understanding like what emotions are going on, like not understanding their behaviors. Why is it that they can't do anything besides play video games? And the central question that I work with gamers on, and this I think is the biggest problem for gamers is, they're very analytically intelligent. And so they know what the right answer is. They just can't seem to do it. Mm -hmm. So what I really help gamers do is bridge the gap between like being able, because like, the, the funny thing is most people don't know what to do, but gamers know what to do. They just can't bring themselves to do it. And that's a lot of the work that I do now. And that's because at the end of the day, you know, as much as I like, I enjoy working my, with my clients and like investment banking and stuff. I find that work engaging, but I actually don't care about investment banking as a field. Like I don't, you know, I care about gamers and I like, I'm a gamer and I like gamers and I like working with gamers. So yeah. that's who I am. That's what I do. Um, so for, for me, the idea of breaching that gap, what we, we started to talk about last week of intense mm -hmm. versus manifesting action is the most mm -hmm. interesting thing because it is absolutely my biggest problem for sure. So, so I have a personal okay. connection to that. Um, I get, I, I guess where we could start is how much do we understand right now about the brain and the control we have over it? Because I think when you look at neuroscience as a field, there's a lot of pop, science i think is what it's called where like people write these sort of books about it and it's like a 200 page thing that's like distilled from a couple of studies 
and it ends up being a New York Times bestseller, and then everyone thinks that that's the way that you think about things, right? And, and, and then yeah. there's other people that are trying to get a little bit deeper into it, like Daniel Kaufman are thinking fast and slow. But like, I, I've I don't feel like the I don't feel like people really understand, and I don't understand what we actually know about how we can control this thing because because after a little bit of that that's our mind because after a little bit of like exportation of it i've just realized how little i seem to have power over it yeah so i think if you want to understand your mind you have to take a step back and in a weird way i think you're looking for answers in the wrong place okay so let's remember that medicine is about populations right so the field of neuroscience tries to understand like different parts of the brain and tries to figure out, okay, the amygdala governs our fear and survival response. Our frontal lobes are the things that um, give us impulse control and allow us to plan and execute actions. But what medicine is focused on is not the individual. It's focused on like the common elements of humans. Okay. And I think the biggest challenge that people face is if you're looking for neuroscience to give you an answer, into like how you can be a more productive human being, I think you're looking in the wrong place. Because neuroscience is about averages. Medicine is about averages. So let me just give you an example. Um, so do you know how we came up with the 2,000 calories a day re FDA recommendation? No. So in 1960 or 1950, there was something called the NHANES study where basically like the Food and Drug Administration or Department of Public Health, I don't know, I think it was the FDA, sent out a survey to Americans and said, are you healthy and what do you eat over the course of a week? And then what they did is they took all the people that are healthy and they averaged what they ate and they broke it down into like calories, carbs, fat, and protein. And they said, okay, this is our recommendation and it's 2,000 calories a day. And so that's not based on any science and it's not based on any individuality. It's just based on the average of what people eat. They took and all so the that, people that are healthy. What does that mean? So like people who said, I have no diseases, they took their answers and they averaged them all together. Subjectively? And that's how they came up with it. Huh? Subjectively? Yes. Okay. <laughs> they, they just said like, are you healthy? Like, do you, do you take any medication? Do you have any diseases? And people who said no for both of those <laughs> are the ones that they took their answers and they averaged them all together. And then we have a 2000 calorie a day recommendation. 50 years later, has there been science since then on that? That people must've gone back and looked at it and seen if there was. No. Or did people just assume that that's the answer. <laughs> that That's what we hear. What the hell? Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. Like it's crazy. So like we know a lot. So, so I can study like, uh, and, and this is what you have to understand is that medicine is about averages. So when they say that like, the amygdala governs a fear response the way that they do that, because this is the way that medicine works, right? So they take a, they take 50 people and they scan their brains and they say, okay, we're going to show 50 people like pictures of zombies. Yeah. And we're going to see which part of the brain lights up. And for each person, their response to a zombie is going to be different. Sure. But then what happens is we draw, we average all of their brain scans and we say, okay, this is the part that governs fear. But what you have to remember is that like each person is like, that's going to apply poorly to any individual person. So any conclusion from medicine is going to apply. So from scientific research is going to apply to very few people. Do you get that? No, because it seems to me that if you make a conclusion based on the average response to something, then it would follow that the average person would respond in that way. It, it follows that Absolutely. not every single person, is, but, but, but the, the, the highest so, count that we can get, right? Beautiful, mm -hmm. Devin. So let me ask you something. If you want to develop a strategy so that your intentions become manifestations, do you want to develop that strategy based on the average person or based on you? Ultimately, it has to be on you, but you have to have some kind of observational hypothesis first to be able to even have an idea of how to do it. Absolutely. I completely agree with mm -hmm. you. So then the question becomes, where does your observational hypothesis come from? I, I so would you assume can, studies, averages, things like that, right? Yeah. yeah. So what would a yogi say? They would probably say to just go do it yourself and figure it out, right? <laughs> yep. Yeah. And I think that's going to be better. Okay. So I think you can use a lot of neuroscience mm -hmm. for sure. I think you should, I mean, like I'm, I, I've studied, I mean, I'm a neuroscience researcher or not anymore, but I used to be. 
And so I'm a big fan of neuroscience. I got really excited about neuroscience. I think it's huge. But I think if you're talking about individual transformation, you can read as many studies as you want to on neuroscience. And like all of those studies are going to be about the average person. They're not going to be about you. So ultimately, you can use that as a starting point. So like, I'm not saying you shouldn't use that information, but I'm saying if, if you're really thinking about how to transform your life, like it's been my experience that, you know, there's neuroscience, there's applied neuroscience, there's psychology, mm -hmm. and then there's like psychotherapy. Like, do you see that, that spectrum that we're moving from like general knowledge to individual change? I do see that, especially with the advent of, I think, more Eastern practice in, in the West. The, the problem with the totally personal quest is that there is no sounding board for it. So what I mean by that is there's no way for me individually to tell how much control I have over myself, especially if I don't yet have control over myself. So the only way for me to do that is to go to studies or go to our, our understanding of science to help buffet that. Does that make sense? No, not at all. Okay. So, let, so let, <laughs> let me challenge that. Yeah, yeah, please, yeah. <laughs> so so when you say that there's no sounding board like so what like so let's say that you have an assumption that you have 50% control over over yourself. Uh-huh. And then you go and you read a neuroscience study about motivation. Like how is that going to help you figure out how much control you have over yourself? Like how is that an effective sounding board? Because it's the only sounding board because I I have no idea what my potential is, right? So uh, if I set to, if I set out to complete ten things, and then I complete two things, and then the next day I complete four things, the next day I complete no things, right? I, I have no idea what the hell is going on. But if there's a study that says on average human beings do five things at their at this level once they do these practices, I can use that as a sounding board to self improve, right? I understand where your logic is. I just disagree with you because Why? I think that the whole problem here is that you're judging yourself based on the average person. And like, that's not a good way to judge yourself. But my argument would be there is no other way to judge yourself. Oh, sure there is. You can just judge, judge yourself purely subjectively, right? So it's not, so like, do you stop at five because that's the average? Do you stop at six because that's the average? You're above average. You would, you would uh, stop when you got to your point, but uh, hmm, okay, here, this might be a better way to say it. Okay. Um, let's take something that's like more, that, that's like less subjective like mind stuff and let's take something like physical okay so we know that after like a certain certain amount of cardiovascular training uh, a human being can run a mile in a certain number of minutes right it helps to know okay. that because if you are doing something like an army pt test where you where you need to create an average of people to perform at a fitness level that you know to accomplish certain tasks right then then what you do is you set up a series of studies to determine what that level of fitness is, and then you apply that across an average po population. So maybe the best example to use when we're talking about averages is the army, right? Where they're, so, uh, yeah. So com I completely agree, mm -hmm. but let's, so now you're talking about a different thing because you're talking about a standard for a population. Yeah, what you think were saying is what medicine use, is. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I think if you want to use a popular, uh, so if I, like, let, let's talk about like how you become licensed to be a doctor. Yeah. So I have my own individual barometer of like my understanding of medicine. Okay. And I don't think it matters how much more or less I know about medicine than the average person. Like the important thing to me is whether I'm satisfied with my knowledge and whether my knowledge is sufficient to help the people that I want to help. Okay. Now, that's a personal journey. Now, if I want to be a practicing physician, I sure as, as, sure as hell want to know what I need to get on the licensing exams to get a license. Yeah. Right. So I agree with you there that if you're talking about, but in that moment, I'm not like an, someone who's trying to be, to hit a certain benchmark to become part of a population. Does that make sense? It makes, it makes sense. So, so my, my question would be, um, can you imagine a world where, uh, science actually goes into the mind enough that it, uh, disproves a concept like willpower, for example? I mean, I think if science disproves willpower, that's fine. I think that the challenge is that that doesn't help the individual. Well, understanding so our, do you think that understanding our limits helps? Uh, well, understanding our limits or understanding what are, what are and are not our limits would help an individual on their personal quest 
as to what towards what we're talking about, which is so yeah, uh, uh, our understanding our limits on a personal level or on a scientific level. On a scientific level. I mean, I think it helps. Yeah. So I I think this this is where it kind of comes back to what you're saying about kind of hypothesis generation. Mm -hmm. So I think science is useful in terms of helping us sort of like start the process of self exploration. Okay. So, right. So, so I think science. So like it's useful to know, for example, from science, I think this is, but ultimately it comes down to the individual. I think it's useful to know, for example, that our frontal lobes and our amygdala have a reciprocal inhibition. What does that mean? So, so uh, the frontal lobe is the part of our brain that allows us to do the things that we should do. Mm -hmm. It allows things like impulse control. It allows things like delaying gratification. Okay. And then we also know that that the frontal lobe does a good job of shutting off our amygdala, which is in our limbic system, which is kind of our centers of negative emotion. Mm -hmm. We also know that our uh, amygdala and limbic system, our centers of emotion, shut down the frontal lobe. So I think it's a useful mechanism to understand that like, when I get emotional, my ability to de delay gratification and control my impulses goes down. Mm -hmm. And it's also important to know that if I strengthen my frontal lobe, the better I get at delaying gratification, the less power emotions will have over me. There's a reciprocal inhibition. So both of them, each one has the ability to shut off the other. Okay. But I think in a simple way, like you can study science to arrive at that conclusion. And then I can just ask you the simple question, Devin, when you're pissed off, do you make good decisions or bad decisions? Yeah, typically bad decisions, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And like, ultimately, like we needed a thousand studies to teach us that lesson. Well, you might have needed a thousand. Someone probably needed a thousand hours of meditation to ask that question. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Right. So yeah, I, I think that, that in thing. my experience, so what I find is actually one of the biggest things that, I, and, and maybe I have a bias because of the people that I work with. I work with people who are highly motivated and highly successful. And one of the biggest problems that they have in terms of finding peace or happiness, and this is true of gamers too, is that they enter a comparative mindset. Yeah, this is a and huge problem And the big for me. problem yeah. that I have with the spirit of what you're saying, like I don't think we should abandon neuroscience. Like I use it a lot. I use it every day. The problem is that when you set your standard, when you assume a standard that is external or comparative, because if if – if you set a standard and you say most people are able to achieve five tasks a day and you're a, a, able to achieve two, like how does that help you today? All it tells you is that you're doing a shitty job. Like that doesn't actually, like totally. that's all it tells you. But if it tells you that you can do that, then it could give you the impetus to improve. I agree. But I think that in a weird way, I'm not sure that you can do that. Right, because okay. in this mm. moment, I don't know that it's actually possible for you to do five tasks. Right, yeah. Like, I think you have to focus on doing two tasks tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So I think that the problem with setting an external standard for yourself is that, I mean, let's just think about it this way. So, you know, I look around and I see that all my friends are, I'm just, I'm just thinking about myself like back in high school. Mm -hmm. I look around at all my friends and, and see that like they have girlfriends and I don't. Mm -hmm. And so I know it's theoretically possible for me to have a girlfriend and I can try to work at it. But in a weird way, like the way that I ended up getting actually getting a girlfriend is has nothing to do with striving to get a girlfriend. That's true. Yeah. Which, which doesn't mean that there isn't positive stuff that can come out of like striving to get a girlfriend. But I would argue that it's actually like damaging to strive for that. And most of the people that I work with, I'd say that if you want a girlfriend, actually don't try to get a girlfriend, just focus on yourself and become a better person. And you'll become like more attractive to other people. And oftentimes as they make a comparison to others, they're looking for something that someone else has, which in turn blinds them to what they actually would benefit from. So it's damaging to strive for it because you're going after the wrong reasons for pursuing it versus... Uh, it, it's an ex. Whenever you go after something, what you're saying is, when you go after something that is externally driven, you're not going to get a response that's authentic to yourself. If it was Absolutely. internally driven. So, uh -huh. if we're talking, if your main question is, how does intention? How can if I want to do something and I want to make that a reality? Mm -hmm. I think the more that you focus on yourself and the less you use an external standard, the better you're going to be at being able to do that. So we talk about jobs, we talk about careers, but we don't talk about callings. And I think that's a big problem.
What's the difference? You tell me. We talk about jobs and we talk about careers, but we don't talk about callings. I, w I would say that maybe a calling in the way that you're describing it is. Devin, why similar. do you stream? Why do I stream? Yeah. Uh, to make the greatest amount of positive impact on people. Uh, is I, that I, a job? I, I'm a weird case because I don't need to do it because I do another job. But most people probably stream to make money or like as a job. Yeah, I don't do that as a job. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. So case in point, right? Mm-hmm. So like that's something like do you do you when you stream, how do you feel about yourself? Usually pretty bad. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Why is that? Um, streaming is extremely difficult. It's really negative most of the time, and it requires like really long hours. And um, there's just a lot of negativity on the internet that gets to me. Okay. Yeah. So I sort of actually broadcast in spite of that. And, and, and I know like the, maybe the typical answer is supposed to be like, oh, like I feel so great. I feel like I'm achieving my, my calling and stuff. It's more like an obligation of something that I feel like I, I, I should do because I'm um, providing value, which is just like, I have to be here to do that. So, right? so yeah. beautiful. It's not the wrong answer, Devin. It's oh, the right okay. answer. It's the best answer. So now this is very, very important to understand. Mm -hmm. Most human beings, when they have an intention, what gets in the way is the negative feelings or negative outcomes. You get that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And somehow you are able to do something in spite of those negative feelings or negative outcomes. You have somehow stumbled upon the silver bullet which is to do something even though it hurts. Yeah, but I feel like and that just it, creates a, a, a per, it just a per, it's perpetually sucks. <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah, so like, that, <laughs> that we need to work on. Yeah, okay. So we can work on that. So that's, it sounds like that's what we're talking about today. Yeah. But, but I just want you to like, just pause and think about this for a second. Mm. You're able to like enter this shit storm of streaming on a daily basis. And there's a part of you that hates doing it. And yet, if we think about what are the things that get in the way from intention to manifestation, isn't it the bad stuff? Like if, if becoming a millionaire was like involved eating burritos every day, like people could do it. Like you could, if, if gaming and like eating sushi and traveling the world was what was necessary to become a millionaire, everyone could do it. The reason that becoming a millionaire is hard is because you have to do things that you don't like to do. And what I hear from you is that you're able to do things that are actually painful and difficult for you, but somehow you find the strength to get up every day and do it. Yeah, eventually. Uh, I'm never on time, but yeah, I eventually do. That's that's yeah. fine, yeah. Mm -hmm. right? So let's just think about this for a second. It, if we have a life where we're no longer restricted by pain, suffering, and negative emotions and negative feedback, and we can do things in spite of that, like... Imagine how much control you have over your life. That doesn't make sense to me. If we lived a life without negative emotions, no, no. we would have a lot of control. We're, so sorry. No, no. Not without. If we lived a life where negative negative experiences did not prevent us from doing the things that we want did to do. Did not prevent us from doing them. Yeah. How much freedom do you have in life? I would assume a lot, assuming that's the assuming that's the actual barrier, but I'm not Sure it is. Okay. So the, I think for many people, it's it's one big one, right? Because generally yeah. speaking, people don't do things because they're hard. They do things that are easy. Like, why do people play video games? Because it's fucking easy. Yeah, but don't you think there's... Do you think that there's also sort of a societal or cultural uh, aspect of this where we have sort of pushed the tasks... So, like, once you get into doing things like... um pay-per-click advertising, for example, and you're like, it, it, it's not like really technical work and it's actually pretty fun. It's almost like a game in of itself to figure out like these demographics and like these audiences. It's actually really similar to gaming. Uh, it's kind of weird how the, it, it's a parallel, but we've sort of, as a society, pushed these topics over here and said, these are not fun. And, and now everyone's sort of grown up knowing that. How much of it do you think, like in terms of distribution of these tasks is actually stuff that human beings don't want to do or, or, or just things they think they don't want to do? I don't understand your question. It's important because 
what's use the millionaire burrito example that you had. So, so you said if being a millionaire was easy and everyone just had to eat burritos to do it, they would do it. But, but what if society as a whole just like believed that burrito eating was really difficult, not fun, and disgusting? Okay. Like what I'm saying is this is a really hard concept. I'm not sure I'm going to get this right. But the tasks that move people to the top of hierarchies, they, beco- they, they, they are difficult and uncommon um, by, by virtue of a, of a sort of cultural significance around that thing, right? Like, like there, there's, there's people say building a business is difficult. But we don't know that building a business is actually that difficult. Um, but there's been a lot of like societal stigma around it. And, and now the perception is the difficult. So maybe people don't even try. Yeah. So l- let me yeah. see if I understand you. Mm-hmm. So how much of, how much of our perception? So you're, so my, okay, let's just, how much of our, and, and exactly. Make, yeah. How much of our perception yeah. is so, actual so, barriers psychologically and how much of it is, I'm, like, I'm making a claim yeah. that if you are no longer controlled by your negative experiences, you have freedom in life and what you intend will become real. That is the claim you're making. And you are saying, but how much of what, so that involves like freedom from negative experience, but your response is how much of our definition of negative experience is determined by society and may be false. Right. Which matters because even if you get rid of the negative experience, you still have that barrier after that. If that's true. Does that make sense? I hear you. Mm -hmm. So now we come back to what I was saying earlier, which is this is why you should not look externally for a comparison bar. All right. So then let's go back to that question and say so, let's assume that what let's assume that's right and that we can't look externally where do we look and i know the, the answer isn't obviously into the self because that doesn't mean anything no no, no i, I yeah. know so yeah. so i think i think we look at so what we're what i'm what we're highlighting now is the difference between a job and a calling okay Right. So like a job is what society tells you to do in order to be successful and secure. Mm -hmm. A calling is something that like you, you feel like is a duty or a responsibility. Last time we talked about Dharma, you remember that? Yes. And you said that like part of the reason that you stream is because you feel like it's an obligation. Yeah. Duty or responsibility is how you define it. Yeah. Yeah. So you do this because you see that something is wrong in the world and that you feel like you have the capacity to try to fix it. Exactly. And that's where you get the strength to deal with trolls, the negative emotions, the whatever makes it difficult for you to stream. Yes. And you also say that, you know, some people make premises like, oh, starting a business is hard. Whereas what you're telling me is that you actually really enjoy doing things that other people find to be boring or difficult. And you thrive off of that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so I think what you're doing is exactly what I'm advocating, which is stop looking at what other people are doing and start to think a little bit about what is it that you enjoy. What is it that you want to do? What is the change that you want to see in the world? And then like take a stab at it. I mean, this is a fancy way of saying look in the self, but I think looking in the self is very difficult and it's like kind of directionless. Something that yeah. yoga hippies say. <laughs> yeah. Like, so let's be let's be scientists about it. So what does that actually mean? It means like thinking about what are the things. So th- this is, I think, if you want a concrete task. So here's one. What are the things that you can do despite them being difficult that you like oddly enough other people are bitching and moaning about but you're actually completely fine doing meditating uh going to exercise like yoga or things like that reading books um these are things that come pretty easy to me personally uh that are often like difficult things for other people yeah Yeah. so i think when when for your for your listeners and my listeners and all the listeners Mm -hmm. and everyone who's watching vods you know, I think that's a question that they should ask themselves. So looking into yourself is a systematic process that involves a lot of different dimensions. And one is like, what are the things that are hard objectively, right? That the standard people say are difficult, but that I actually enjoy doing. So what are things that come easy to me that seem hard for other people? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think if you capitalize on that, if you understand that, if you try to build a life based on that, then you're not going to be like, even though things are objectively hard, they're not going to be like you, you're going to be able to do it. You're going to be able to succeed. And and Buddha did an amazing thing. He re- recognized that duk, duk means suffering, is different from pain. He said there are two layers of human like experience. There's emotions, which is like happiness, sadness, pain, grief, shame, and then there's this other layer, which is peace or suffering. So like, for example, eight years ago, my dad passed away. Mm -hmm. 
And it was a really like awesome experience for me in a weird way because I felt a lot of negative emotion and I was at peace. It's a really bizarre thing because we tend to as associate negative emotion with a lack of peace. But you can actually attain a state where there's a part of me that sort of recognized. And I think people who have lost, especially parents, you know, we'll get to this point, hopefully at one point where you sort of accept it. Like, yeah, you miss them, but you're also at peace with it. And you can like, you can sleep easy at night because they lived a happy life and they provided for you and you guys had like a valuable relationship and it meant a lot to you, but now they're gone and that's okay. Right. That's peace. And you can have grief and peace at the same time. The, the Buddha described dukkha, I believe as a sort of sense of uncomfortableness, right? A sort of a sort of sense of just like things, a lot of people mistranslate it as suffering, right? But it, it's actually just a sense of not being comfortable with the state of things. It, it's that way we think of I, suffering as like, okay, you're really cold or, or you're, or you're, you're starving, but it's not that it's, it's it, this, right. It's the sense of unfulfillment, a, a void. Yeah. So I, I think that's one yeah. source of book. But I, I think you're so I think suffering, I think, is actually a pretty good translation. I mean, this is why okay. I think mm. we have to use Sanskrit because but but what Buddha was saying, I think the reason that we get you say it's quote unquote mistranslated is because people equate suffering to physical or emotional. Pain. That's what I mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's that's the whole point I'm saying is that suffering in the way that Buddha talks about it is independent of those things. Yeah. OK. So mm. my first clinical experience teaching meditation was teaching meditation to cancer patients. And cancer patients have really bad pain. And we were doing a study where we wanted to teach cancer patients pain, and we wanted to say, okay, this, like, this is going to improve their pain. So we give them a, a questionnaire, and we say, like, okay, how bad is your pain today? Scale up from 1 to 10. And so most people will say, like, 9, because our study's criteria was people who were very sick. And then they, they take that survey every day for a week, and they say it's basically 9 every day. Then we teach a meditation for a month or two months, and then we ask them, okay, now let's ask you what your pain is. And guess what their number is? Uh, I actually, the resume says is lower, isn't it? It's like 20% lower. It's like seven or eight. Nope. It's nine. It's still nine. It's still nine. Haven't, haven't so then they we shown... start scratching our heads. Okay. We start scratching mm -hmm. our heads and we're like, Hmm. So like, did we not do this right? And we start talking to people. Maybe our study didn't succeed. And then when I talked to people, like there was one woman who like blew my mind. She said, no, I think I loved it. I'm glad you guys taught me this. I find it incredibly helpful. And then I'm kind of scratching my head and I'm like, but, but if it's, you're saying it's incredibly helpful, but oh. you're still in a lot of pain, like, how does that work? And she says, what, after learning how to meditate, I can put a window between me and the pain. It doesn't so reduce the, pain the is actual still there. pain. It reduces your response to it. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So she's more mm -hmm. at peace. She feels more content. Now, this is the interesting thing. Her pain score is still a nine. What do you think happens to the amount of pain medication she uses? Does it lower? Absolutely. Really? To the tune of three hundred and sixty-three dollars a day. Oh my God! What? Because her ability to change her response to that pain is that significant? Absolutely. Do any of the mental factors around stress or anything go increase as a result of that? You'd assume well, I that. I don't like, understand the question. Okay, so if you're if you're assuming that uh, you have less pain medication, you're in more pain. Um, would would any kind of like stress? increase or bad mental states increase as a result of that or no of not having pain medication yeah because she, she's she's reducing her pain no. medication so the stress doesn't yeah, go up no well. yeah. on the contrary so it's it's because her stress level is better that she can tolerate higher levels of pain and her overall wow. mental state is actually way better because she's not like hopped up on pain meds so she's not like slipping in and out of consciousness because she's like got a bunch of narcotics you've given these patients um a meditation practice, their pain is still the same, their response to the pain is lessened, and also their stress levels have lessened. Yeah. And you equate that reduction of stress to the reason why their response to pain is better. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't like the word stress because I don't know exactly what you mean by that. Uh -huh. But so if, if we look at it, so what it is, is their ability to tolerate. So let me put it this way. Their ability to tolerate higher levels of pain improves. So their discomfort from the pain is better. Okay. Discomfort from the pain is better. Okay. So, so, so this goes back to what we were talking about, which is the separation of physical and emotional pain from what suffering actually is. Yeah. 
All right. And that's important because when we go pursue this self-improvement in ourselves, that's a critical thing we need to know. Well, I mean, I think it's or, just important to understand that like, so a lot of people live like the puppet in their life is their negative experience. Mm -hmm. Sorry, the puppet master in their life, like okay. they're puppets and they're controlled by their negative experiences. Right. So like you a just, sense can you of define, like when you say negative experience, do you mean past? Do you mean current? Or do you so mean I'll give you. So like, let's say yeah. that I'm I'm in class and I have something that I think would be a valuable point to make. Mm -hmm. But I'm afraid of how I'm going to sound because I'm like self-conscious about my voice. So I'm embarrassed by it. And so then I don't speak. OK, right? so, so in that about, way, it's controlled your action. Yeah. yeah. So like anxiety mm -hmm. controls people's lives. And so if you want to overcome anxiety, like there are a lot of different ways to do it. But if, if we're t talking about like, you know, what, like when I want to do something in life, like what gets in the way? So I think anxiety is a great example of some kind of emotion or some kind of internal experience or some kind of like suffering that prevents me from doing the thing that I want to do. Yeah. If I really like a girl and I want to ask her out, but I'm afraid she's going to say no and I never end up asking her. And then I regret it for years. Like, what is the thing that kept me from doing the thing that I like I really wanted to do? Yeah. It's the fear of rejection. Right? It's the lack of self-confidence. Why and does so the, if sorry. Yeah, go for it. Why does the it just makes no sense to me? Why does the brain do this where it'll it'll offer you like an initial fear of rejection? And let's put on a scale of one to a hundred, that's like a one in a negative experience. But the fucking experience of 40 years of regret of not asking that girl out is like so much infinitely worse. What, why does the brain preload you? Why do we preload ourselves? Better question to, to that narrative. What, like what, where, yes. where's the, where's the cost versus benefit in that? Like, so I think there are a lot of things that the brain do does that seem like they're mistakes to us, but we mm -hmm. have to understand that the brain is not stupid. The brain is just operating under a different set of like values. So the brain's priorities are just different from what we want them to be. Okay. <laughs> right? So like this is where, so, so for example, this is something that I was explaining to people earlier. Anxiety is not real. I mean, it's an illness, but when I really stop and think about it, what I realized one day is that anxiety is a learned behavior. So like anxiety is not like, sure, it causes people a lot of suffering, but anxiety is generally speaking something that people learn at some point that's a protective mechanism. So if you have a kid who gets bullied in school, they learn early on that like if I – like when they're – so when you have like a six-year-old who's getting bullied, there's a part of their brain. So I want you to just envision this scenario. So there's a, there's a, a kid on the playground. He's six years old, and he's being made fun of by like half a dozen kids. Okay. And the kids are sort of in a semicircle or even like full circle, and he's been, being surrounded. Yeah. And they're making fun of him, right? So that's something that I definitely experienced when I was a kid. I think a lot of gamers go through something like that. What do you think is happening? What is what is that person's brain teaching them in that moment? Uh, that any kind of self-expression to lead to this kind of scenario is bad? Sure. Yeah. So then let's say 15 minutes, the bullies get bored and they move on. And then how does the, how does the kid feel? Horrible, right? Like, I, I never want to do that again. I never want to do that again. Yeah. But they also feel relief. Oh, now that it's over. Now that it's over, right? Yeah. And so the brain teaches them something very simple, which is that when there, there are a bunch of people looking at me, I'm in danger. Do you see that? Yeah. The, one, of the, one of the ways I heard this said was uh, in reference to agoraphobia. So the, the example was like somebody has like a, um, a bad feeling or something bad happens in like a public place, like a mall. And, and now the mall then becomes the associate. And then they go home and they feel better. So the mall becomes that place of like negativity. They never go back there. The home is the place that's secure, right? It's the same type of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Same thing. Mm -hmm. So do you want to just tell people what agoraphobia is? Uh, the fear of um, like public places or like uh, social events or things like that. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what happens is like then, so the brain from a very primitive point, like, like early on in development, right? When like all the Play-Doh is still soft before it starts to like harden and we like, so a lot of stuff that happens very early on is very impactful for our programming for the rest of life. Like things like learning how to walk and the capacity to learn language. So our brain is really laying down very, very 
foundation when we're young. Mm -hmm. And so when this kid is very young, he learns a very simple thing, which is that when I'm being looked at, I'm in danger. And as long as no one sees me, I'm fine. And so the next day he goes to school. And I mean, if, if this is, this is what happened to me is like, I was smart, right? So like I knew the right answer and the, the teacher would call on me. Everyone's looking at me and I'd give the right answer. What do you think would happen at recess after I gave the right answer? Would people actually make fun of you? Like, or yeah. come at you again? Right. Because the stupid kids who were larger than I was <laughs> didn't know the right answer. Yeah. So they'd call me smarty pants or teacher's pet or whatever. And, and so then like, then my, my brain is learning even more. It's like, okay, if I open my mouth, even in a relatively safe place, like I'm going to pay for it later. Yeah. So then what happens is I end up with something called social anxiety, which is that like, I can be out at a restaurant with people that I don't know. And even though no one, no one has bullied me for years, that programming has gotten laid down that like when everyone is looking for me, like I'm in danger. Okay. And if you ask someone about social anxiety, they'll tell you, they're like, I know these thoughts are crazy, but when I'm at a dinner table with six people that I've never met and I open my mouth, my heart starts racing. That's a danger response. That's a physiologic response. Right. They can't help themselves. Yeah. That's their brain, quote unquote, doing that to them. And this is where we kind of say, like, why does the brain do stupid shit to us? And it's because that's just what the brain knows how to do. Like, it just, it doesn't understand. It's trying to protect you. Okay. So, so this is something, go ahead. Well, I have a really important distinction that's going to be, I think, a super hard answer. But when you say this leads back to the brain's priorities are different from what we want them to be, uh, who's we? Because if, the, if, if this is all made up into the brain, uh, we're some outside force that's opposing this, obviously, since we have the consciousness to do so, right? Like there's one part of you that's saying, I don't want to be socially anxious. There's another part that is, it seems almost coded in. So, so it's absolutely coded. So, so, so I guess like the example of like an actualized person, maybe they might actually have that response at a dinner table, but then the awareness comes in. They say, okay, here's this response. I'm going anyway. Right. What is creating that opposition? Yeah. So like, this is where, okay. So like, cause that's it's a good question. Shit, so right? yeah, yeah. The, the, the I'm going to, I'm going to, there, there's like a more scientific answer and there's a less scientific answer. So the more scientific answer is something that people call the observing self. Okay. So there is a part of you that is able to, in a detached way, like <laughs> notice things about yourself and like observe things kind of objectively. Mm -hmm. So this is the part of you that allows you to reflect on your thought process. So the observer and the observed are two different things. And if we think about it, like sometimes you're caught up in your thoughts, like this may sound weird, but Sometimes you're caught up in your thoughts and you're thinking and you're kind of not really aware of what you're thinking. You're just lost in the thinking. Yes. Yeah. Right. And then there are other times where you can actually notice your thought. So there is something outside of your thinking mind that is noticing what the thoughts are. And you may have that that may cause thoughts to arise, but there is some amount of like self-reflective capacity. Okay. So this is in, in, um, in psychology or neuroscience or whatever, people sort of talk about this thing called the observing self. Now, on a far deeper level, like, so people have just made the observation that, oh, I have the capacity to, like, understand something about what I do. What I do, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, or what I think or who I am. And yeah. what the yogis actually, they, they went so, one put, uh, so they went one step further and they actually tunneled down and, and explored the depth of the mind. And what they realized is there is some part of us that they call the Atman, which is more loosely translated the as self. soul yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, or consciousness. Mm -hmm. And the consciousness is separate from the mind. The mind is a thinking machine, but that consciousness is separate and that the purest form of consciousness is like something that's divine. Okay. And when you, when we like become pure consciousness, then we're enlightened when you're coming kind of completely free from the mind. And there's, so this may be kind of a, a weird thing that people have trouble understanding. So we can go through a quick exercise where I can kind of lay it out for sure, you. Sure. Yeah. So people tend to think, first of all, that consciousness and mind are the same thing. So let's understand the different states of mind and being that we all experience and see how consciousness and mind are actually separate. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is, what are we doing? Like, so right now, Devin, is your consciousness active? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. And yeah. is your mind active? Yes. 
Okay. So the, uh, the other way to put this is, are you aware? Yes or no? I am. These are really difficult words because they could mean a lot of things. No, no. Uh, just, yeah. just answer the question simply. Are you aware? De Devin? I think so. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The answer is yes. Yeah, okay. Don't worry. Let, <laughs> so we got to step away from fucking philosophy. Yeah, it's okay? some weird like, shit. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> no, no, no. Just all of that yeah. stuff. So the yogis <laughs> didn't care about, like, oh, like, are the we in the, the matrix? Are we yeah. not in the matrix? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. just forget. Mm -hmm. Just like, are you aware right now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I, yeah, yeah, you're aware. I'm, I'm aware of okay. myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And are you having thoughts? I am. Okay. Yeah. So now let's think about what is the state of mind where we don't have consciousness and we have no thoughts? What is the state of mind where we do where we do have consciousness? No, or where we so, don't so first, have consciousness. Actually, let me take a step thoughts. back. Yeah. So your state of mind right now, we're going to call wakefulness. Okay. Okay. Wakefulness. This is wakefulness. Mm -hmm. So what state of mind has no consciousness and no thoughts? Sleep. Absolutely. Yeah. Easy. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. No consciousness. No thoughts. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the state of mind of dreaming? Do we know that? Yes. What, do you have thoughts? Yes or no? In dreaming. This is really hard, man. Like, um, because is, is no, a dream considered a thought? What do you think? I don't think so. So um, do you have thoughts when you dream? You can think while dreaming. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the mind yeah, is active can, in a dream, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> Are you conscious in a dream? Sometimes, but not always. Not usually. Yeah, not usually. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So now we have, and then we also have something called a daydream. Why do we call it a daydream? Because you're awake. What is daydreaming? You're, you're, Are you you're aware in a daydream? Not usually. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have thoughts in a daydream? Yes. Absolutely. Right? Mm -hmm. So now we have, when, when con consciousness, consciousness plus thinking is wakefulness, no consciousness, no thinking is sleep. And then we fucking human beings, we <laughs> understand this stuff so well that we came up with a word that describes the other. And then we have dreaming, which is no consciousness with thoughts. And then we have daydreaming, which is no consciousness with thoughts. So do you see that like even between sleep and wake, we have found a common state of mind and we use the same word to describe it. Yes. Daydream versus dream. Yes. Because human beings intuitively understand that I'm lost in my thoughts and I'm kind of not aware of what's going on. Yes, they do intuitively understand that. So now, so now we're filling out a two by two table, right? Yep. You get that? Yeah, I do. And so then now the question becomes, what is consciousness without thought? It's meditation. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> yeah. So when people ask me, what is meditation? That's it. That's that is super meditation. cool. Okay. I totally get that. Meditation is consciousness without thought. Yep. Now you've heard that phrase a thousand times before. Yeah, but not but like in context. We don't, but mm -hmm. we don't understand, like we don't like we don't explain what that means. And it's actually like it's mind blowing. Yeah, it is. It's, it's you insane. can teach this stuff. You can ask a six year old these questions and they'll give you the right answers. The six-year-old will give me more confident answers than you will because you fucking read too many books. <laughs> That's true. That's the uh, whole Zen practice of um, of uh, just yeah, like and, forget. And yeah, you yeah, know yeah. what happens yeah. with so so now, Devin, we're going to come full circle. Mm -hmm. So what's what's the difference between a six-year-old answering these questions and you? I've read too many books, right? Yeah, yeah. So what is that? That's relying on an external standard. Wait, wait. Uh, run that by me again. How, how do you mean? Yeah, so like um, it, the difference between the six year old and you is like, remember how you you know what to what standard to set yourself against unless you look at something objective and external, right? You were yeah. saying like, how do you know like how what you should strive for unless you look outside? So the difference between you and the six year old is you've read a bunch of books. Yeah. So you have a lot of external standards in your mind that are actually you have to like dismantle to get to your actual experience. Like when I ask you, are you aware? A six-year-old is going to say, yeah. Whereas you're like, well, what is awareness? Yeah, yeah. Like, are we... Are, Wait, are so you're saying I basically aware? fucked up my whole life because I read 700 self-improvement books and now I have to work through all that shit because I, like, I'm, I, to get back to where I started? Yes. Nice. Right? And so, so, so Devin, Great. Devin, now all you right. understand, now, so now you're ready to understand what... <laughs> to understand it took what? me you my entire out, life yeah. to paint like a child. It took me my entire life to paint like a, t a child. Now you get it. 
That's what he was saying. And I, you cut out. That's who he was saying. Leonardo da Vinci. He, that's what he said? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. But all this presupposes that you have all the answers inside you. Like, where does that, where do we, where do we come to with that? That, that seems like a weird, like, Mimi, like, Yogi thing, right? Like, um, so are you saying that there literally is no value in external? That no, no, I think there's, right. there's immense value in external stuff. There's immense value. <laughs> I don't. I don't then just, what, what's the dichotomy? I don't understand. Like, what, what's the dichotomy? Because, like, it, it's like on one hand, I have to forget every Tony Robbins speech I've ever heard to become enlightened, right? Like, but on the other hand, I have to like, like, there's some value in it. I don't. I don't like. Where is the? Yeah. yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll. So I'm gonna share a story with you, okay? Yeah, sure. So like, this is where like I can we can I can try to explain it in a couple ways. I'm just gonna share a story, see if this resonates. So have you ever heard of the story of how Buddha became enlightened? Oh yeah. What What's your understanding of the story? Well, it's a really long. St so okay, so my understanding. Okay, is let me, <laughs> let yeah, me just okay. tell my version. Okay, sure. Okay. He's like, how much do you want? Yeah. So Buddha, <laughs> Buddha was doing a lot of strict asceticism. So he had yeah. studied with a lot of teachers, and he was like doing the really hardcore meditation stuff because yeah, he wanted yeah. to be enlightened. He's like, I'm going to starve myself. So right. he did a Cold, lot of intense he, fasting. He was a shamana. Like he would live in the forest with a loincloth. Yeah. Nothing, so he yeah. was like, mm -hmm. he was he was like gray and on the brink of death, and yeah. had like. It, it thought like, okay, like it's not enough. I'm not enlightened yet. So I'm going to go further. I'm going to go further. I'm hardcore. This is what all the texts and all the external people say that I should do. And I know that I've enlightened, people have been gotten enlightened this way. So I'm going to do it. And he's doing it and he's doing it. He's on the brink of death. He's emaciated. He's like all skin and bones. And this young girl walks by. I kind of envision her as a nine-year-old girl. And she's got a pail of rice pudding. And she sees this dude who's clearly like an ascetic. And she kind of says... She's like, she also sees that he's like, he was not like really looking great. Like he looks yeah. sick and he's <laughs> pale and he's thin. And she's like, Hey man, do you want some rice pudding? And then rice pudding is like, you know, it's, it's, it's dense. It's delicious. It's creamy. It's sweet. It's a dessert. And like here Buddha is like, he's not even eating like crusts of bread. He's like depriving himself of water. Mm -hmm. and he like looks at her and he's like, you know what? Yes, I do. <laughs> and then he eats the rice pudding and he's like, you know what? This shit is fucking delicious. <laughs> and then he's like, why the hell have I been doing this this whole time? He's like, how can something so simple and so pure that I enjoy so much? Like, how can the road to enlightenment like mean avoiding this or giving this up? And then in that moment, he says, fuck it. This is all stupid. All of this strict asceticism, everything that I've done, it just doesn't work. It's stupid. There's just no way to become enlightened. It's all false. So the Buddha has rice pudding and he goes, why the hell have I ever, why, why was I? Yeah. Yeah. He's like, yeah. this is stupid. Like, like I've yeah. deprived myself of all of this stuff. This is such a, a pure and simple joy. Like all these people are idiots. I've tried it. It doesn't work. He says, fuck it. And then he goes and sits under a people tree and gets enlightened. 40 days later. Yeah. Right. Like, huh? Well, he goes and sits under a buddy tree and it takes him 40 days. I, and, I don't know. Well, I thought he I thought he didn't eat also during that. I, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So so the point being that there is actually an answer to why he didn't have the rice pudding, right? It, it's that that separation from that desire was what was supposed to spark that enlightenment in the first place. I'm sorry, can you say that again? Yeah. It's, it's so so the whole reason he set out to do all the stuff that a shamana does, which is like uh basically try to destroy themselves is to get away from desire to get away from that attachment so that you reach a point where you're not dependent on those things and you're free from them. That was the whole point of going through all that suffering. Yeah. So that, that, that's the, the crazy thing about enlightenment is that like, you know, you, you conquer all of the desires except for the desire of enlightenment. Okay. And it's the desire for enlightenment that causes you to get rid of everything else. But ultimately that's a desire that has to be given up too. I see. Mm -hmm. But but like and that's what was holding Buddha back. Was that he still desired to become enlightened? Yeah. So when he says "fuck it, I'm done," that's when it happens. But that's because he already did all the other work, isn't it? Uh, like like, like technically, technically, yeah. if you really look at Zen traditions, no. Yeah, so yeah, remember yeah, that yeah, enlightenment yeah. enlightenment is binary. It's not. Yeah, it's on or on or off. Yeah. You you could right? in theory so, like any so what kind of you child did before give it all that yeah. moment it's not like he got fifty percent of the way there yeah so that's that's why like when you look at Zen masters like you know what they do when they become enlightened what they laugh 
because they realize the futility of everything they've been doing. I see. Yeah, Alan Watts has a really good segment on this where he talks about exactly this, that like you, um, there's a way that Zen masters trick their students, right? They, they, have a, they have a sort of, in the beginning, like you go in and you say, I really want to learn how to become enlightened and you can teach me. And then the Zen master says, no, I can't teach you. I have nothing to teach you. And the student says, no, I know that you have something to teach me because there are all these people hanging around and they are trying to learn from you. And the master goes, no, I didn't ask them to be here. They're just hanging out and I can't get them to leave. And, 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 and like the master kind of convinces you that there really is nothing to teach. And that is the answer. But that doesn't become self-apparent until you spend years in the ashram because you haven't actually internalized that. And you finally reach the end of it and you get there and you're like, oh my God, that old bastard was right. There really was nothing for me to know. Yeah. And so now definitely come back to you, my friend. Yeah. What's the value of 700 books? I have to feel like it had some value, but maybe that's, um, maybe that's my ego trying to defend the amount of investment of time that I had into that thing. No, no, no. It does have some value. It has You to. have to spend a lot of time also, reading um, those books I've to recognize how useless they are. Oh. I needed to read the books to understand that I don't need to know what's in the books. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Right. So this is this is the, this is transcendence. Like you have to move above and beyond the phenomena of like reading and all that good stuff. So I think like <laughs> you know books have value, and neuroscience has value, and ultimately I think one of the biggest problems that I see practically is that people go looking for answers in books, and I think you can learn a lot from books, but I, I've never. Actually, I was about to say. So I, I think I've. I was about to say, I've never heard of a book changing someone's life, but that's not true. <laughs> it, it definitely can. I can think of yeah, books. Yeah, and I mean, I was just yeah. thinking about my own life. There are books that have changed my life. So, But changing your life is such a broad term, right? I, I yeah, think, I I mean, think I, what, what you meant by changing your life when you initially said that was different. Like changing your life, like an internal realization, like a, a moment of Satori, like a, a Japanese. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was, um, this is a really good segue into something that I, I definitely want to talk to you about. Um, I was on a podcast. I'm on a, I'm on the, there's the number one podcast on Twitch is this podcast called the scuff podcast. And I guess I've somehow finagled my way into being co-producer of this podcast. And we bring on different personalities, usually provocative personalities. And there was one particular person, the show goes out to tens of thousands of people. So it's significant, right? One particular person came out and said that absolutely 100% video game addiction does not exist. Um, and the 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 way that they justified that was they said there are no hard studies on video game addiction existing um and that it's basically this sort of fabrication um of mainstream media uh and and uh, and people to promote this I idea um of video games being like this toxic influence on people's lives now i countered with the fact that i knew anecdotally and by observation uh, including of myself of a lot of people that had video game addiction and furthermore that by dismissing it in the same way that you would dismiss like depression or something will actually do damage to all these people who really do have these addictions and uh, and that essentially like anything can be addiction addiction but i because i didn't have the science there i couldn't mount uh a good argument and uh okay. and, and more or less i i, I don't uh, feel good about how it ended up, and I'd like to be better equipped to handle that because of the influence it can have. Was the person yeah. a researcher? No, they're a journalist. Even worse. Okay. Yeah. So you're you're asking like, <laughs> what's the argument to make that video game addiction exists? I I think it's a um no I, I think I'm I'm starting a conversation with you about video game addiction and and your take on it, and then from there maybe extrapolating onto like um where we can go uh at, if we have that conversation with people like, okay. like like what's the what's the what's the thought process you have around this well so i i'm tempted to kind of respond to that person's point so like yeah t totally is it okay if i start there so the first yeah. thing is devin does depression exist 100 percent. how do we know well 
we know through a combination of observation, but also a lot of very concrete studies that show um, chemical Beautiful. differences in the brain. Yeah. As a result of serotonin <laughs> loss and dopamine. Yeah. Nope. Oh. Nope. That's not what the studies show. Okay. It's not what the studies show. What what they, what they, what they show? But... So now we have to understand a little bit about how psychiatric diagnoses are made. Okay. <laughs> so a millennia ago, not really a millennia ago, there was a group <laughs> that came up with this book called the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistics Manual. Yeah. So what people were doing, so a bunch of psychiatry researchers sat down, they scratched their head and they said, we want to study depression, but like, how do we know who has depression and who doesn't? And specifically, these people were very interested in pharmacologic trials. So someone says like, okay, if I want to study a drug to treat depression, how can I, how can I decide like who qualifies for depression and who doesn't? Like, where is the dividing line between depression and not depression? Makes sense. So they came up with something called the DSM, which is like a, a, a checklist of features. So for example, for major depressive disorder, there are nine possible things and you have to check five out of the nine boxes. And, right, if you and we have this for everything, check, right? Schizophrenia. Huh? We have this for everything. Schizophrenia, like this absolutely. is the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. So if you check five out of the nine boxes, you qualify as depression. And the whole reason they came with the DS uh, came up with the DSM is because researchers were trying to figure out if I'm studying a drug, how are we going to know that the people that I'm testing are the same people that you're testing? Yeah. So we have to come up with a consensus for research to make sure we're talking about, generally speaking, the same thing. Okay. This is where the criteria for depression came from, and this is where the studies on depression came from. When we proved that depression existed. We used a checklist that a group of people came up with, and we just sort of, by fiat, got together and decided this means depression. Okay. There is no real scientific foundation for our diagnosis of depression. That there's can't no real, be. huh? That can't be because we can notice a chemical difference in the brain and people that are depressed. I know we can do that. Okay, so. But let's remember like order of operations, right? Yeah. When did we classify depression as an illness? And, and neuroscience has come a really far way. But there are actually even now disputes about whether people with depression have lower serotonin levels than people who don't have really? depression. Yes. All we know is that serotonin boosting agents seem to improve depression. Right. SSRS, and we have yeah. some really okay. general studies which suggest that some neurotransmitters are kind of messed up. But if you actually talk to neurotrans, like the people who are doing this research, it's so far from clinical application because we just don't understand how the brain works. It's not like your serotonin does all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. It governs like it governs like peristalsis in the gut. <laughs> it governs like all kinds of chemical signaling. It governs like how your eyes are able to see. It governs all sorts what? of stuff. Yeah, so like, think about this. Think, do you know how many neurotransmitters there are? No. Like a dozen. Okay, so there's like dopamine, there's serotonin, there's like, there are endogenous opioids, they're like, there's like, there aren't that many neurotransmitters. Because remember that a neurotransmitter is a signal. Mm -hmm. It's something that like, gets dumped into a, something called a synaptic cleft and then travels to a neuron and then hits a receptor. I mean, the kind of receptor that, how can I, is the kind of receptor it activates triggers a completely different thing. So we only have like a dozen neurotransmitters. And like, even though we have a dozen neurotransmitters, our brain is capable of doing all kinds of things from creating music to holding in our urine to falling in love. And that's just governed by a dozen neurotransmitters. Okay, but but when when we when we remove dopamine from mice, they don't eat, they lose yep. motivation to do anything, right? So yep. so like we can we can individually control some of these neurotransmitters to affect behavior. Yes. And from that, do, do you not think that we can make some kind of conclusion as to what these things are influencing? Yes, absolutely. But so that let's must be clear. have value in that's terms just, of serotonin. That's depression. just yeah. some kind of conclusion, right? So that's the money statement. So like our sense of science in psychiatry and addiction and stuff like that is very different. Like so when when someone gets pneumonia, like that's pneumonia. We can see the bug, we can give it an antibiotic, we can kill the bug and the person gets better. Okay. Mental health is not like that. So I absolutely believe that depression exists, but if you really look at the data, 
the gap between basic science and clinical application in psychiatry is huge compared to any other system of medicine. You're saying there is no way we can see depression in the brain reliably. No. We, we have to observe it in the behavior of the individual and their self-reported well, results. I, actually, let, let me rephrase. So I'm not saying there's no way that we can see it, but what I can tell you is that in the diagnosis, so when I'm making a diagnosis of depression, an yeah. MRI is not part of the diagnostic Well, obviously, workup. no. Yeah. Well, well, hold on. Why is that obvious? Because aren't well, we talking about because, objectively? No, no, no. Because, it, it, um, because it's very hard from a medical standpoint to like extract all the chemicals, to do a brain reading of all the chemicals that you have. Like, Absolutely. That, that's why we don't do it. It's not, it's so, not because so like, the, yeah. Yeah. The the first thing to understand is that for this person to say there are no hard studies that diagnose video game addiction is a stupid statement because there are no hard studies to diagnose depression because depression is a clinical diagnosis. Mm -hmm. It's not a, a biopsy. Like you can't biop some, biopsy someone, brain scan someone, blood test someone for depression. It's just it's a clinical diagnosis. And addictions are clinical diagnoses. And so you can come up with criteria, you can make a clinical assessment, but the idea that there's some kind of silver bullet like there is for a blood culture, like HIV is, is I mean, even then practically you make it a clinical diagnosis, but there's a yeah. test that you can prove whether someone has HIV or doesn't have HIV. This is also the case with things like, um, uh, like uh, herpes simplex virus, right? Where like you can, you can sort of see uh, uh, that there are, certain antibodies in the bloodstream but there is absolutely no way to see the actual virus like things like there's all kinds of stuff like that right well yeah but i mean so but that's just because seeing the antibodies is easier but you can see the actual like you can you can actually see the virus because you can do something called a viral load okay so that's like what you do is you take some like i think sample of i don't know if they test the rna but you can you can do like a load which shows like what amount of HIV. So the antibody just tells you whether you've been infected in the past or not. But there's another test called a viral load which shows you like what's the burden of virus in this person's body. Why don't we do so that? When why don't we do that for what? Like when we're doing blood tests for people with viruses and stuff to, to figure out how. how well, heavy we the load we is do there. for HIV. Oh, so like, for example, so for HIV, let's say that like, cause you're going to, you know, that with HIV, we have a lot of like resistant strains. So when yeah. I, when I give you a medicine, I don't know if your HIV is going to be resistant to it or not. Uh -huh. So even though you can have a positive antibody, a positive antibody just means that your immune system has seen it before. It doesn't mean that you're actively infected or not actively infected, but usually it means that you've basically been exposed. Yes. It means there's a decent chance you're infected. Right. But in order to determine whether the medication is working, we do viral loads. I see. So we can do okay. that. Okay, interesting. But there's yeah. nothing like this, no matter how granular you get with mental health. Not yet. Right? It, because it, our understanding our understanding of the brain and the mind is in its infancy compared to like the physiology of the heart or like our understanding of like the gut. Okay, so then how do we evaluate that someone actually has a real problem? It's 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 the DSM and observational. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, but but hold on. So now the, the story of the DSM. I'm not done yet. Yeah. Okay. So remember the, the DSM actually is not a clinical manual. So the DSM Wait, was. It's not. It's just it's a research manual. So it's a group of researchers saying how can we agree that we're all talking about the same thing. Okay. So the the DSM was developed for inclusion criteria for studies. So when you go and sign up for a study, they oh. ask you, are you depressed? So like if I if I'm doing a study and I'm gonna say like I'm gonna do I, I'm developing the Devin Nash treatment for depression. Yeah. And then people <laughs> say like, okay, how are you gonna like find depressed people? I'm gonna ask him, hey man, are you depressed? And they're like, Yeah. And I'm like, okay, come on, you're <laughs> gonna spend an hour with Devin Nash. And then at the end of the hour, I'm gonna ask you, hey man, are you depressed? And he says no. And I'm like, boom, done. Sure. <laughs> Right. So researchers sat down and they were like, well, we have to we have to figure out, like, how are we going to know whether people get better? How are we going to know, like, who to include? How are we going to draw the line for where depression is? And that's when they came up with their five out of nine criteria. OK, then what happened <laughs> is insurance companies were trying to figure out, OK, this person says they're depressed. How do we know whether like we can't blood test them? So how do we know whether we want to pay for their treatment? <laughs> We're going to see if they meet DSM criteria because someone has a criteria somewhere and we're an insurance company and we want to see if we pay for treatment, whether it's going to get better or not get better. And the studies on antidepressants, after all, are using these criteria. 
So we're going to use billing reimbursement and things like that based on the DSM. But the criteria itself is totally subjective. And when the insurance totally doing subjective. it, huh? The criteria itself is totally subjective. Like we go it's full circle totally back to the, the whole, the, the thing you said at the very first part of this talk is the 2000 calorie limit. It was just a bunch Absolutely. of people came to a consensus and said it was a thing. So it is a thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. It's the same way that the dollar has value because we all got together and agreed. So like the, the, the thing to remember about medicine, which I think a lot of people don't realize is a lot of medicine is not very scientific, right? So medicine is like a clinical discipline. So at the end of the day, you know, like even after all of this testing, if you really look at studies, 90% of clinical diagnosis, doesn't matter what field of medicine you're in, like 90% of diagnosis is made clinically. A doctor comes in like cancer is like for the most part diagnosed clinically. No shit. Yeah, absolutely. How do you think that the person ends up getting a biopsy in the first place? Like, why don't you like Devin, are you getting a biopsy tomorrow? Uh, hopefully not. <laughs> yeah. Why not? Yeah. I don't feel bad. Yeah. And furthermore, <laughs> the last time you saw your doctor, did he send you in for a cancer biopsy? He did not, but I did do a full round of blood tests a month ago and everything and nothing came up weird. So, so we do. Okay. So, and that's a scientific thing, right? Cause so like, um, we looked at all the levels of different things in my body, triglycerides, um, HbA1c, right? And everything appeared within normal ranges, whatever that is. So we made a determination that I don't need a biopsy or anything else based on that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, but but even then, so it sounds like you did some routine testing. I mean, we won't go into details about that, but yeah. mm -hmm. like the whole reason that someone orders is like when, when a doctor says, okay, I want to get a biopsy or I want to get a scan, mm -hmm. it's because their clinical suspicion, oh, like you've been having weight loss and you've got a lump growing on your shoulder. Let's biopsy that. Like yeah. it's all clinical. Right. Right. So it's not actually, so tests in medicine are used to confirm diagnoses, not to find diagnoses. So the first thing that this person doesn't understand is like video game addiction has the same standard, meets the same standard as like depression. Okay. There's no blood test for schizophrenia. Yeah. There's no brain scan for schizophrenia. Is there for, for so any kind of psychosis or anything like that? We literally... Wait, wait, wait. Okay, nope. hold on. Okay, because this is insane. Yep. If you take the brain of a psychotic patient who you who is like saying there's a pink elephant right there that is yelling at me, and then you take the brain of a normal person, there is no difference. You can't. There's no reading or test we can do that tells the difference between those two people. Nope. Okay. In Alzheimer's people, if I know for a fact, if you take the uh, the brain scans, they do look different. You can actually see the, the matter of the brain is reduced. Yes. So Alzheimer's is something we can diagnose scientifically. Uh, actually, technically, Alzheimer's can only be diagnosed through autopsy and biopsy, but that's besides. Uh, but so, but so you can what, physically see the, the, the brain matter is reduced in, I mean, like we, yeah, we, but, we pull but up images all, But of, the reason yeah. that you can't diagnose Alzheimer's through that is because there are a lot of reasons why brain matter can be reduced. Like what else could produce brain matter? So any other of the dementing diseases uh -huh. are, 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 we lose brain matter just over the course of life. If you have things like vascular disease, your brain matter can be smaller. Like there are all kinds of reasons your brain mass can be reduced. So Alzheimer's can really only be diagnosed by a biopsy, technically. So it's okay. a clinical diagnosis. Okay, but psychosis, you can take a psychotic patient who is literally screaming at a wall that there are bugs coming out of it. And then you can take another person right next to them who's like, hey man, how's it going? And they look exactly the same on, on, on any kind of technology we have to tell. They don't look exactly the same, but there isn't enough information from either scan to differentiate. Like if I showed a radiologist a picture of a psychotic person and a picture of you, the radiologist would, would not be, be able to tell which one is which. Would he even have it a suspicion? The same. Huh? Would he even have a suspicion that one is the other? Or is Probably it literally 50-50? Probably not. Although I do think that if you take on average people who have psychotic disease over time, there are some findings in the brain on average, but those are like research findings that are not like, they're not enough of a smoking gun to be clinically useful yet. Does that make sense? Kind of, but is that a technicality? Cause isn't it, isn't the correlation to actually become clinically useful like incredibly high? Like we need, we have a really high standard for something to become clinically correlated. Yes. And, uh, and so is there a fair argument in saying that at some point you would have to dispense with that really high standard to make any kind of progress whatsoever? Because it, like, for example, but, um, in nutrition, right there, uh, I, I could point you to, this is something I know a lot about cause I used to, I used to teach this. Um, you can't, you, this is the same problem. You can't really point. I can't really tell you that vegetables are better for you. 
Um, be, because like when you really look down into the data, it doesn't objectively show that. But I can fucking tell you that vegetables are better for you. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. 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 So, and I, I think that's just like, there's a shortcoming of science. So like, yeah. we're not mm. willing to dispense. So, I mean, practically there are some cases where if I have a psychotic patient, I will order an MRI, but that's because if this clinical diag if the clinical story doesn't fit with psychosis, then sometimes, so for example, if, if you like, if just like, let's say like you walked into the ED and you have no history of psychosis, you're a high functioning dude you're socially capable and you're like hallucinating, I'm going to order a blood test really? or a urine test. Yes. For what? For like cocaine. You're looking for LSD or something. LSD. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, mm -hmm. so like there are tests and tests have value, but usually tests for psychosis or to rule out because psychosis can be caused by more than schizophrenia, right? They can be caused, psychosis can be caused by drugs. So the experience of hallucinations yeah. can be caused by drugs. They can be caused by some illnesses. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you have a brain tumor, you can become psychotic. Yeah, that's nuts, by the way. But, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, like, like there is value in, in ordering brain scans on people who have mental illness to rule out organic causes or, like, primary, like, their mental illness is secondary to something else that's going on in their body. Right? So, for a good one is, like, some people who are depressed, that's because their thyroid hormone is very low. And right. if you, yeah. like, because they're, like, thyroid's shot. So if you give them thyroid hormone, their depression goes away. So like testing has a role in psychiatry, but it's just, you know, if this, if someone says, oh, like there haven't been good studies proving video game addiction exists. Well, yeah, but that's because like fucking Mario was developed in 1980 and we've had depression <laughs> like rolling through our population for the last 5,000 plus years. Like, How, has it been that long? Thing. Depression? Well, there isn't there that meme that like people got started to get depressed like when the industrial era came about. Like, is that is that true? Is it or or is, is de people, do we have depression like going back? Like, there's Romans have read have written about it or what? Sure. Like, oh, yeah, really? absolutely. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I, I I do think that we got more depressed when, once the industrial area came along, and we're getting even more depressed now. Yeah. The suicide rate amongst adolescents has gone up by fifty percent in the last seven years. In the last seven years. Seven years. We're, globally or in the United States? I think U.S. Oh my God! What's an adolescent? adolescent. Uh, adolescent. Uh, what, uh, someone like, under like, the age of eighteen. Okay, like under the age of eighteen. 12. Yeah, I just wanted the age range. So Twelve and eighteen. Twelve to eighteen. So, so the rate of suicide for adolescents has gone up fifty percent in seven years. People to age twelve I to eighteen. So. I think it's adolescents and not everyone, but I could be wrong there. Uh, and it's also true that uh, middle-aged white men are the most um, common suicidal. Uh, or, or people that commit suicide, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. men commit. If you take a hundred people who commit suicide, eighty of them are going to be men. God. I think it's a four to one ratio. Oh my god. White male privilege, baby. <laughs> we can't say that here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. Jesus. Okay. So. Okay. So 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 the the whole hard studies, no hard studies to diagnose depression. This almost ties back into your point that we can't really trust external objective reality. That, 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 like, that, like, remember we were going back to, like, it, right? Wow, like, that's, that's a broad connection. But no, but, but is I it? I got to think about that. Be, be, because, yeah. because, um, your, your, your whole point, I, I think that's like, because uh, I was trying to, like, sometimes I try to, like, find, like, a theme of a talk. Yeah, and, yeah, I hear you. Yeah. And, and I feel like the theme of today was, like, we really can't trust our outside experience. So, so, and the only way that you as a clinician are evoking this idea of someone being depressed is by receiving, listening to their internal experience and then interpreting it for them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, mean more, I or less, use like, more than just their subjective internal experience. Right. So I'll, I'll, I'll use like how they look, what their face displays, how they sound. Uh, so, so, <laughs> so, so I, I mean, I use sensory data. Uh, okay, so it, then I am I am more lost than I've ever been before. Okay, now we can get started. So, so, so <laughs> because like if you have if you have nothing, all right. Let's say that you're Devin. What's your yeah. question? Just just what's your question? What do you mean? What's, what's my question? question? I have tons of questions. What do you mean? Like okay, yeah. Just ask yeah. the one that's in your head. 
Well, is it dumb? I think it's dumb, but here we go. Um, if you're floating in a tank and you need something to hold on to, but by definition, there are no walls because everything is external. All you have is yourself. What do you do? See, that's that's why I have to think about my questions before I ask them because they don't make sense unless I do that. So, I mean, yeah. because I think that that's what the yogis <laughs> discovered, right? At the end of the day. So the way to understand what your consciousness is, is to check into it in all kinds of different moments. So like when I meditated, I found this part of me that seemed to be like calm and peaceful and empty, horribly empty, terrifyingly empty, and at the same time, wonderfully comforting. But just like, it's kind of like looking at the Grand Canyon. It's like, it's crazy, but it's also magnificent. It's like terrifying and awe-inspiring. And, and that's what you sort of feel on the inside when you have some spiritual experiences of meditation. And then I went through my life and I, I got pretty good at tapping into that. So I could basically tap into it whenever I wanted. Mm -hmm. And then I went through various experiences in my life where I was wondering whether, um, like I was wondering whether I could have an experience that would take that away. So I, as I got more and more grounded in it, then like, I remember like the, you know, like my dad passed away and like, I was like at his funeral and, and like, despite the fact that I was grieving, I still found that sort of calm, peaceful emptiness within me. And I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. That's still there. And if I tapped into it, I sort of felt okay. Like, even though I was feeling grief and sadness, there was something inside me that felt tranquil. And then a few weeks later I got married. And so that's presumably, you know, a very happy day of my life. Oh, and boy. even during that happiness, like I felt that same amount of like emptiness and void within me. And I was like, oh, like that's that's the one thing in my life that is completely constant. So can I let me ask you, like. Do you. You, you've done this like incredible amount of self introspection and study and meditation, but when you appear to me as a person who still struggles with all the problems of being human, right? You still get depressed, mm -hmm. I assume, and you still get like anxious sometimes and things like that. Like, sure. um, so, so I don't know, like, if on your off time, like, when you get off the call, like, you're like fighting Dormammu or something with the powers that you've gained from like Tibetan meditation or whatever. But like, like, what it seems to me is like, if, if do you feel like you've gone somewhere? Like, what is the point of all this if you're still just going to experience? suffering and uh and anxiety and depression and you have all these things like where well, where did you end up like where are you today that makes any difference in the path that you've taken why should we do it at all well because because i i think i suffer less than many other people you do yeah why do you think that because i found that thing within like that's my whole point right like remember we're talking about what so, so, so it did and, get better for you. Yeah. Well, so yeah. The, the emotional pain. So my cancer pain remains still the a nine. Is still a nine. It just doesn't bother me as much. All right. And, and do you that's think that's the worth? You do it. Do you think that's worth it? Do you think it's a good enough reason? Absolutely. To do it? Because and, that's the only thing that's worth it. That's the only thing that's worth it. Yeah. Because like, so now when I like when when stuff goes well for me or doesn't go well for me, like I tend to be like okay with one. Okay with what? Either one. Either one. So, so Devin, like the whole reason, so when we think about like, when I think about my, the change in my life, right, from being like failing out of college and graduating with a 2.6, like you would think that after applying to medical school for two years in a row and getting over 40 rejections, I would be bummed out. Yeah. And like you would think that I would stop. But like the whole point is that sure, I felt disappointment, but I also felt tranquility. And so I just kept doing it. And, and like, that's the value, right? So, so what's happened is that I'm no longer, I mean, I am, but for the most part, I think like, cause I'm not a different person. This is like, this has to be understood. Like people think that I made some amazing transformational change, but like 2.6 GPA instructor in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Like that's a big gap. Yeah. And people think that you have to like change a lot. Like the whole point that I try to tell people is I, I'm actually not that smart. Like I'm not, I'm just not that, like I'm smart. Like I know I'm smart, but I'm not like that smart. That's probably not true. So, so I would say if, if you looked at you, if you looked at the, your, if you did an IQ test, you'd probably be like 130, 140, 150. Like, like you have to realize you probably have an insane 
a, a amount of um I think about this a lot with like a lot of software engineers and people like that like um they just come in with such a high IQ and the ability to cognate in these things it's such so a huge let, advantage right like let me let me rephrase yeah so when I look at other people and I think about my trajectory in life and their trajectory in life I don't think that IQ is the thing that's responsible for my success I think it is being able to not let my negative experiences impact my intentions. Because I'm telling you, like, I I'm not that, like, you look at, like, people who are addicted to video games, like, a lot of them are fucking brilliant. Yeah, definitely. Like, the, yeah, like truly this is brilliant. what I'm telling yeah. you is, is when, I, when, I, when I play with my friends, so, like, I have a group of people that I used to play Dota with, and I think I'm, I'm objectively far more successful than, than they are, mm -hmm. but I'm pretty sure... I'm not much smarter or smarter at all. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I see what you're saying. There's, right? There's like, a ton well, of people that play video games that are unbelievably just, smart. Yeah. So it's it, it, I, that's what I'm saying. I'm not like I'm I'm definitely smarter than like the average person walking down the street. Probably substantially smarter than the average person walking down the street. But I think if you look at video games, video games select for people who have very high IQs. Why? I don't disagree. I'm just wondering. Very why. simple. Uh, yeah. So very simple. So let me ask you something. So I'll tell you a story that a video of uh, someone, a uh, gamer I was working with. So video gamer is in second grade. They go into math class and teacher says, here's your math worksheet for the day. The kid looks at it, fills it out in about 10 minutes, walks up to the teacher and says, here's the worksheet. Can I have the next one? What do you think the teacher says? I don't know. Teacher says, that's what we're doing today. You'll get the next one tomorrow. Okay. Please sit down and quietly sit at your desk. <laughs> And the kid goes back. So then what happens is like, so school moves at the pace of the slowest kid. Yeah, right. It has to. So then what happens is this kid goes home and then he beats level one of Ninja Gaiden. And do you know what's waiting for him? Level two. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you're a smart kid, why the fuck would you want to invest in a classroom that is just 50 minutes of boring and 10 minutes of interesting? versus uh, an intellectual challenge that is literally paced exactly to you. Mm. Because you know what? If he's not ready for level two, you know what he has trouble doing? He can't beat, he has trouble at level one. He can't. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So video games for smart kids, video games give them the intellectual challenge that they don't find in the rest. Yeah. Okay, that completely and makes sense. to them. Yeah. It's not complicated. It's not no, like it's some not. deep yeah. scientific. It's just like. It makes perfect sense. If yeah. You just yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like one of the reasons that video games are addictive is because they're perfectly paced to you. No job is perfectly paced to you. Right. No class is perfectly paced to you. Right. Like no wonder people like playing video games. Yeah. Makes because they're going to. They're, it, it's like video games are like a spiritual, like a, an enlightened spiritual guru who meets you exactly where you are and knows the next step you need to take. Except in a weird way, you're not getting any benefit from playing them, right? You're not getting any benefit. Why is that? Well, so, well, so, so why is benefit. it? Well, what I'm saying is like, right. if, if you accomplish a hard task in real life, it has like a reverberation to it that like results in like positive outcomes for you. But if you do that in a video game, it's ephemeral. It's not quite there. Why is that? Well, I think that's because, generally speaking, we think about hard tasks as having real-world value. So our, oh. our society tends to value things that are harder to do, i.e. back to our burrito for you know, yeah, eating burritos yeah. for a million dollars. We tend to pay people more based on the difficulty of what they do. Not the difficulty of what they do, but how rare it is for someone, for someone to be to able do to it. do that. Yeah. But but uh, uh, what I'm saying is on the same token. So let's say that you complete like a really hard like Ninja Gaiden. It's actually funny that you bring that up because that's a very hard game, uh, yeah. but especially the original ones are some of the hardest games like out there. So let's say you actually do beat Ninja Gaiden and you go all the way through. That sense of accomplishment that you get as a result of completing that is ephemeral. It just kind of floats away. But in real life, when you do something that is really difficult, like you um, build a house or you um, or you, you know, that is probably like a big stream thing, some equivalent thing of value. Like um, you create something or so, like it seems to have more staying power. Do you know what I mean? I don't have a good yeah. way to describe this, but like yeah. uh, w w w what I'm trying to ask is like, why is it that 
the accomplishments that come from video games just sort of float away from us. They escape us. It's like they're not even real to begin with. I know they aren't, but there's a lot of accomplishments in real life that we can do, like get a girlfriend, for example. Um, no, it's not well, a because good, co- co- that's not a like. No, I, I understand your question. Yeah. So it's like it's like, like completing so a marathon. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna read into your question a little bit. The first mm-hmm. premise that I think you're making is that for a few moments, the accomplishment that you get in the video game feels the same. It, it, yeah, as it an does accomplishment exactly, life, but it right? doesn't last. Yes, but it doesn't mm-hmm. last. Right. Mm-hmm. So like that's the first thing to recognize. And this is where, once again, your brain doesn't know the difference. Like your brain is actually in, in some way relatively smart and also incredibly stupid. Mm-hmm. Your brain doesn't understand the, all the brain understands. So you have this thing that there's a, actually it's funny. I have a YouTube video all about this, about something that I call the triumph circuit. And the brain doesn't understand. So you get like a dopamine reward upon completing a task that is proportional to the difficulty of the task. Okay. And if you think about it, like if you use like a God mode cheat code in a video game, does the video game become more or less fun? Oh, it sucks. Yeah. Like you, you completely, Absolutely. you're just like, this sucks. Yeah. So, mm. so our brain is wired to get more of a dopamine response when there's difficulty involved. And so like, why do people love Dark Souls? Because it's hard and it's like, you have to, Absolutely. Yeah, and you really, really have to figure out the exact way to do it. And there's and no how shortcuts. does it feel when you when you do well? It feels in Dark Souls. amazing, yeah. You, yeah, right. So this is where someone made a, a fascinating discovery back in 2014 that video games are addictive not because of the reward, but because of the denial of the reward. That <sighs> separates them from all other like drug addictions. When when I shoot up heroin, there's no chance that I'm not going to get high. Like like that's the whole thing, right? Every time I smoke pot, it's going to be good. Every time I snort coke, it's going to be good. Every time I get smashed, it's going to be a good. I mean, there are problems, but yeah. biologically, like I'm going to get the reward from the alcohol. Yeah. What makes video games so damn addictive is that you get the reward sometimes. Like, why do you think so many people play LOL and Fortnite? It's because you don't win very often. And this also goes back to the loot box problem, right? Of like, why do people continuously sure. invest tens of thousands of dollars in loot box? Because you're not sure you're going to get the epic skin that you want. And and they're at they're at a governmental level like the UK is looking at this like holy shit like this is so addictive that we might have to ban this across our country because this is so bad because those are the those are, that's the way that it interacts with us yeah yeah that makes perfect sense so now going back to your original question why is it ephemeral it's because the video games tickle one part of your mind but don't tickle other parts of your mind so when we think about triumph. In the real world, there are other things that go with it. So when I, for example, when I graduated with a medical degree, that was a hard road. And I actually felt neutral when I graduated. Mm -hmm. It's a side result of meditation. But um, there's also a lot of other things that are tied into that, right? So like that means that like when I meet someone, they're going to greet me in a particular way, which reinforces that high. Yeah. yeah. That means Mm -hmm. that when I, you know, when I get pulled over, like, like I have a disaster pass. So a couple of years ago, there was a hurricane and like, I get to go places that other people don't get to go because I have an MD after my name. That's awesome. I never even yeah. thought of that, but that actually makes perfect sense. Like people would send you into a relief zone because like, oh, it's a fucking doctor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so like, so if, cool. like, like if there's like, if there's a hurricane and there's like a barrier with cop cars, I drive up to the cop car, I show my badge and they wave me through. That's insane. Right. So like there are other things in society that reinforce that accomplishment. Whereas like when you play with, play Ninja Gaiden, like, what happens? Yeah, you After. beat it. And then, like, you can make a forum post on Reddit about it, and people are like, cool, dude. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah. Good, 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 good. Yeah. So that's very important. So, mm-hmm. if you make the forum post and it gets upvoted, what happens to your high from beating the game? It continues for a bit. Absolutely. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And then you end up as a streamer. <laughs> and now, suddenly, and now, suddenly, you have subs and you have people and people watch you. And now you're not so different from an MD with a disaster pass, right? Because you're going to TwitchCon. And then, you have societal then is it ephemeral? No. I yeah. don't think so. Yeah. But then you get into all the stress and all that crap. Well, but there's, there's fucking stress of being a doctor. I mean, you, like, like for sure. So it's the, it becomes yeah. this, you're saying it becomes the same at some level. Like, because, yeah, I'm sure, like, Shroud is the best FPS player in existence, right? I mean, he's a literal god of FPS, and he he definitely has the societal clout to back that up, and then tons of opportunities. Uh, at the same time, there's a lot of stress. I mean, for you, um, did you do practicing, like, did you, did you, you've, um, 
you've been in a ho- I'm sorry, I don't know a lot about this, but you've like been in a hospital and people come to you and be like, "Doctor, I've got this problem." Yeah. Like, okay. And, and so so you actually and that's long hours and like really hard and stuff. So like there's a lot of stress to I like so, so the stress of being a doctor is like some of the highest stress there is, right? Uh, so I don't think that that's stressful. So it's hard work, but I don't think it's stressful. I so like for example, the, you know, once again, this is kind of weird. I enjoyed being on call. So like I actually found rather than going to the office from nine to five, I loved the feeling of being like, I I, I sort of got a lot of gratification out of like being the guy, being the guy. Yeah. So like you know when when something so when I take call it or when I used to take call it Mass General, there are two psychiatrists who are working overnight. One okay. of them's a senior and one of them's a junior. And the junior works exclusively in the emergency room. And the senior works in the emergency room and covers anything else that happens in the 960 beds in the hospital. Okay. And so, like, if someone has a psychiatric problem overnight, like, I get paged and I go there. And, like, I really enjoyed that. Like, I sort of like working intensely for long periods of time and then, like, relaxing for long periods of time. Got it. Like, the 9 to 5 grind just doesn't work for me because of my Ayurvedic dosha, which we can talk about one day. But What what does that mean? Sorry, what's so just like Ayurveda, the definition of that? I know Ayurveda yeah. Veda is a is a a practice of um, it's a really old practice of of medicine, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. so it's traditional mm-hmm. Indian medicine, and the big thing that Ayurveda Western medicine doesn't say is that people are fundamentally different. So there are right. different yeah. kinds of cognitive fingerprints. So just as an example, I have a particular kind of memory where I seem very intelligent. Because I learn things very quickly and I'm very dynamic, but I also lose things very quickly. I'm the same way. Like a month ago, I had a medical student rotating with me and I forgot the five out of nine criteria for depression. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And it's just because I don't, like, I'm going to lose it. Yeah. So my memory, I pick things up fast and I lose things fast. Holy shit. I have the same way. I never thought about myself that way, though. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And so a lot of people like think that they're not as smart or, but it's just their, their minds are different and you have to understand like what your mind is good at and what your mind is bad at. And it's not just raw IQ. There are different kinds of memory. There are different kinds of like, so I'm someone who, so I, my mind is very dynamic. So I get bored very easily, Yeah. but I can work intensely for short periods of time. And other people are like slow and steady wins the race. Like some people are like, you know, for example, I, I try to write from time to time and people are like the way that you write is you have to just do like one page a day. Down yeah. What, one page a day. And I'm not like that. You can't what do I'll that. Do you is, write the whole is, article and then you take, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm the yeah. same way. So yeah. like I woke up yesterday morning and I was like, I figured out anxiety. I know everything about anxiety. And it just came to me like a flash of brilliance. I sat down, put a lot of it out and it was done. And it's not done yet, but like I, I got like seven. You have what matters in yeah, ex- yeah. I'm yeah. exactly the same as this. This is actually crazy. Yeah. yeah. And so the the crazy thing is that people don't recognize that your personality and your cognitive fim- fingerprint is not optimized to certain jobs or careers. Right. And if you want to yeah. be successful, you have to figure out okay, what kind of memory do I have? What kind of like people have started to understand this in terms of like introversion and extroversion. Like some people recognize, oh, I'm just not a people person. So if I want to do really well, like I need time to be alone and like not have other people bother me to be productive. Okay. And so the more you understand these kinds of things, you know, the more, the more you can optimize you're be, your life. Yeah. You're going to be. And, and Ayurvedic tradition has, um, oh, there's, there's, there's types of bodies, right? And they're related yes. to elements, fire, water, yes. earth. I yes. know one of them is yes. uh, pit, Pitta. 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 Yeah, you yeah. have you have, yeah. you have some pitta. You're like pitta vata. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, yeah that's 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 so pit, pitta is fire. Yep. And and, and and vata is water. Vata is air and ether. Air and ether. Each okay. one has two mm-hmm. elements. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'm so the one way to think about vata is like the wind. So the wind blows really hard in one direction mm-hmm. and then stops, and then blows really hard in the other direction and then stops. And you used another word called uh, dosha. What is that? Do, so vata pitta and kapha are doshas. Oh, that's like the okay, classic. okay, that's the classic okay. Thing. So, so, yeah. so because of your, yeah, I'm totally on page with you. Okay, yeah, because I know, yeah. I know a little bit about this. So, yeah, uh, yeah. So I think like a, a lot of people don't recognize that if you're, so I'm, I'm, I'm like the wind. So part of the reason that, and I think you are too. So you do more than one thing because you just get really bored if you just had a job or you just did Twitch streaming. Yes, you def- have to be yeah, doing definitely. a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. So one of the best pieces of advice that I got was from an Ayurvedic uh, doctor who I was studying with. And he said, in order for you to be successful, you have to juggle as many balls as you can without dropping a single one. In order for you to be successful, you have to drop as you have to, you, you have to ju- what, juggle. What do, they, what do they mean by that? 
so that I should handle like so part of my problem if he was basically telling me I should do as many different things as I can and still do them well. I shouldn't focus on just one thing. Because he knew that if you focused on one thing you'd be, you'd become bored and you would drop it. Yes. Yeah. Mhm. So now like I I mean I, this whole healthy gamer stuff I have a private practice. I was at a conference today talking about technology and health. Um I like you know, I play video games. I work with esports professionals. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, you do a lot. I, to keep I run yourself workshops. Interested. I run retreats. Like, if I'm just doing the same thing every week, I'm just going to get bored and I'm going to suck at all of it. Yeah, I totally understand. I'm exactly the same way. That's um, but just by curiosity, um, do you have a similar readout in terms of Ayurvedic? You call them dosha. Do you have the same tendency that you sense to me? Uh, I think you yours more is. Pita or... I'm more vata, and you're more pitta. Okay. You also have some kapha more than I do. I'm very extreme in terms of vata and have a fair amount of pitta, mm-hmm. whereas I think you have um, some vata, I th- I'd say a fair amount of pitta. Do you get angry easily? I used to, and then, and then okay. now I almost, I, I don't. I used to have a huge problem with anger. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. so I think you're, you're pitta predominant with some amount of vata and kapha as well. Like mm-hmm. also your, your hair pattern is consistent with a pitta. Yeah, mm-hmm. okay, very cool. Wow, that's super interesting, okay. Um, real quick, sorry. Uh, Jade just hosted us. I don't know if anyone of you saw it. Jade, thank you very much. Um, that uh, for everybody that's just joining, that was like 900 people. So just real quick, it's um, we are meeting with Doctor. I actually pronounced your. I actually got your name here so that I could pronounce because I realized I've been pronouncing it as you introduced yourself before. Alo Canoja. No, no, it's Alok. Al Alok. Ah, Alok. Devin. Kenosha. Devin. It's easy, buddy. It's not all maple. It's all oak. All oak. All Perfect. Oak. Okay. Just like the original Sanskrit. Kenosha. I, yeah. I got the second part, though. Yeah. Okay. Um, all oak is a um, Harvard psychiatrist, and he's talking to us today um, about uh, gaming um, uh, and, and concerns to mental health, and we're going into some really deep subjects, ultimately to try to um, – we're, we're kind of like building a profile and foundation of um, how to – be what would you say be better mentally through 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 uh, under but through a self-understanding and kind of like integrating gaming in a way that's like healthy and and good yeah i mean yeah. I, I think Devin. so yeah. what i try to do like so you know we have classes for things right we have classes for like mathematics and yeah. history yeah. and we're formally taught how these things work mm-hmm. like you go to school and you learn computer science and then you like learn how to program we're never taught how we work like just think totally. about that for a second. Yeah. No, I I, I have. Like in the same way right, that like, we're not we're not taught how to do a lot of things that are really useful, like balance a checkbook or things like that. Like yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we don't we're never taught where do our desires come from? How does my memory work? What are the things that I'm good at? What are the things that I'm bad at? Right? We're not taught how we function as human beings. And so at the end of the day, like you can learn as much as you want medicine or streaming or whatever, but unless you understand yourself, you may still do a good job, but you're going to suffer doing it, right? So, like at some point, Devin, you and I need to talk about why streaming is so painful. For you. Yeah, like I get that, that you, you have the strength thing. to do it. Yeah, uh, but because that's going to get into imposter syndrome, which is like a huge aspect of my life, right? Like, yeah. Um, so, are yeah. you avoiding talking about imposter syndrome? Oh yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, you know the first thing that you, we messaged about, I thought we were going to talk about imposter syndrome on day one. And now we've gone two days without talking about it. Sure, but I, I have, you know, I have some uh, thousand people here, right? That I think could benefit more from these conversations that we're having so far, and setting this like foundation of like how we can help people over the average. Even though I, don't, I know you don't like averages that much, uh, like, like and, and 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 through that, I think we could do greater good than talking about my individual issues. And I don't think most people here have that issue of imposter syndrome, probably, but some people do, but probably not many. You would be surprised. You think so? And I think you have to be a little bit careful because I wonder how much your mind is hiding behind the greater good as a reason to not confront your imposter. Oh, a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but what I'm saying is like I've, I, in an effort to not make it more of a I, – I, I always try to make shows um, less personal if I think that they're going to be for the greater good. But if, it's, if I think that my personal application can actually sure. do a lot of good, then I will talk about it. Yeah. If That's you good. think it will, I think that you're smarter than me, so I'll t- we'll talk about that. Um, I, well, I thought what we I, talked about IQ. Why do you? Hmm? 
Oh, we talked about IQ. I'm not smarter than you. Uh, more aware of this subject matter uh, uh, sure. as to what can happen. I'll, take. I'll so, take more experienced any day of the week. Because sure. I think, because I think, if we really delve deep, what people are most interested in is this thing you said. I think it is not letting my negative experiences impact my intention. I feel like if there is one problem that gamers have, and you identified this as well, and this is what I, if we're, if we're going to go in next week and really delve deep into something, it can be the imposter syndrome thing if you want. I'm up for that. But I think like really trying to understand how to bridge the chasm between God, I want this thing. I want to do this so bad. I, I want to be successful. I want to actualize this in my life. And then day after day goes by and you can't do that. That's also a problem that's personal to me, by the way. To this day, every day, I have that problem. I, I look at the, um, yeah, so, what are the things that, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dude, listen to me. Yeah, if you're <laughs> saying that you have this problem in your personal life and you're saying that what I want to show people on my stream is how their negative experiences don't interfere with their intentions so that they can accomplish what they want to. Yes. You're saying you struggle with that problem. You're saying they struggle with that problem. Yes. What is the way in which you struggle with that problem? Well, I think that's what we're supposed to talk about next, right? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you don't think that's going to be helpful to them? Uh, okay, so you're saying you view the imposter syndrome thing as a negative experience of mine. So that if we get, if we understand that negative experience and how it impacts my intention, then we can use Full that circle, to apply baby. to other people <laughs> to help them all Full as well. Circle. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Using us as a scapegoat says chat. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So they yeah, say, Devin is Devin is hiding behind his nobility. It's one of the most it's the one of the the most difficult or it's one of the easiest places to hide is behind a noble cause. Yeah, it's really good. I, I'm super good at doing this. Yep. Yeah. I, I, can I, tell. I, I could probably do like ten more of these and we would never even talk about it. And that would be yeah. fine. Yeah. But Devin, I'm not gonna let you, my friend. You might forget about I mean, it in the next week and then yeah, <laughs> that's that. It depends. That's usually how I get people. Yeah. <laughs> Are you feeling uncomfortable? Um, no, I'm good, honestly. Okay. Uh, like, like, uh, it, I, I really, when I, when it comes to like, I really am an open book. I'm super open about I talking about sense. anything. Yeah, and I won't, I won't regret it. Um, I don't think that all the stuff that people actually like make fun of me over on the internet is not the stuff that actually gets to me because the number one criticism of me is like, LOL, you're, you're just a pretender. You're not really successful. I actually know I'm successful. So that doesn't do anything to me. So like, I'm not worried about that. Um, yeah, I, I like, I'm totally fine going forward in this the conversation for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I think we should do that next time. Do you yeah. have other kind of thoughts or, or questions or anything before we kind of, I, I gotta probably get going soon. Okay. Um, yes. So, so I think one of the really, important things to establish based on just like the, the subject matter of the talk that we've had was um, uh, sort of a, uh, what I like to have is like a kind of like objective takeaway. So, so what we discussed today had a lot to do with how relying on these sort of external markers of what mental health is or what uh, comparison, right? Like, like, um, this person is so much healthier than me, or this person can accomplish so much more than me, or these studies say I can do this or I can't do this, th that that is really an unreliable barometer and that a more reliable methodology is looking to yourself for answers. So for everyone listening to this, how can, what, what is something we can do between this week and next week where we can start to, to, to look into ourselves for those answers? And stop. What what practice can we utilize to stop paying attention to those external barometers and start focusing internally more? What what can we do? What what's a what's okay. a what's an objective takeaway we could do? Absolutely. Yeah. So mm. let let me just rephrase for a second. So I think mm. that external stuff is good for a hypothesis generate. Right. It's external not stuff good. Is good. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like like I think it's important to like learn about neuro neuroscience and then use that is is like a guide for to, for your, to explore your own experience so like to 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 use like theories of cognitive behavioral theory 
neuroscience or reading about spirituality, but then test it yourself. Because the fact that it worked for anyone else doesn't mean it's it's going to work for you. So you have yeah. to test it for yourself. What? But what? What, so what is that? What? Yeah. Like, like, what is that? When you say you have to test it for yourself, what I'm saying is, I what? Let's say that we just perfectly accomplished today, and and the takeaway now that hopefully a lot of people have is like, man, I, I should really think more about my own internal experience of things. What are they? What's it, you've just given them a, a clay mold, and, and now I'm asking you to help them turn it into something. What over the next week can we do to actually cauterize this process? Okay, so I, I, I don't know about external stuff because I think that's even a little bit. I feel like that's step two. Okay. So I think step one is think about something that you want to do. And then, like, write down what's getting in the way of you doing it. This and is more exactly specifically, what I'm yeah. More specifically, if you need a little bit more guidance on that, so I think you should write down. And then there's a second part to the exercise. Chances are, your first answer will be cognitive. It'll be something like, "I don't have enough time," or "Someone does this," or "Some or someone does that." When you actually think about doing it. Do you feel any emotions or even physical sensations that come up as you bring yourself to do it? So try to get as close as you can to doing it. And as you do it or as you prepare to do it, like what comes up for you physically or emotionally? Either one is fine. So just as an example, like let's say that you need to get a job. Mm -hmm. So when you think about getting a job, like, like I want you to actually go and apply for something, anything. And as you think about going and applying for something, what are the kinds of like resistances that keep you in place? Does that make sense? The last part I'm a little bit lost on. I, so, so like so something is going to get in the way. Like if I say like, okay, I, I need a job. And then let's say that like I tell myself that I needed a job. Yeah. But then if I say like, okay, so like what is a job I can apply for? I can apply for a job at McDonald's. Yeah, and I think about like I'm not actually gonna apply for a job at McDonald's. Like that's mm. ridiculous. Like a job at McDonald's, like a, a job at McDonald's is like like I'm better than that. And so as you think about applying for a job at McDonald's, what do you actually feel comes up? Right, like wh why do you resist doing the thing that you want to do? Why do you resist doing the thing? Okay, yeah, this makes sense. And that resistance has to be in the form of a physical or emotional response. No, so ideally. I'd start by being open-ended. So you can write down why you're not doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Chances are, though, that's going to be a cognitive answer. So I want people to dig a little bit deeper. So give that a shot. Like open source, you can try whatever you to write down whatever you want to. The second thing, so after you do that, then tunnel down into like what are the emotions I'm feeling or what are the physical sensations that I feel? Yeah. Like, oh, I, I want to tell this girl that I like her. As you, like, pick up the phone and you dial her number, like, what happens inside your body? Like, what do you feel in your chest? What do you feel in your stomach? And just write that down. And, and, then, we and, have to and, talk. and then that's it. All, all, you, all you need to do is be aware of that for now. For now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, okay. that's good. Yeah, that's great. Okay. <laughs> well, Devin, thanks a lot, man. This has been fun. I mean, do you thank wanna, you. Yeah. Well, uh, you, so should we like do this next Friday too? Can I would just absolutely love to. Yeah. Yes. So let's yeah. like, cause I think if we're doing exercises, we have to follow up on them. Yeah, sure. Okay, great. And you're still streaming, right? I, oh, of course. Yeah. I'll, I would, I'll stream the whole thing and we'll put no, it. No, no, yeah. I mean like you're streaming now. Can I raid you? Uh, yeah, sure. Of course. If you want. <laughs> yeah. I'll be talking raid, for a while. We're going to raid Devin. All right, man. Thank you very much. It's, it's been a blast. I mean, thank, thank you so much. Uh, um, I think. I, I cannot understate to you how much people are getting out of this. Like the, our, our first talk, I got so many messages, dude. Like, uh, and like, I do crazy stuff on this channel all the time, but like, it wasn't like this. This is, this is yeah. like, this may, this matters. So Devin, thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad.